Good evening. I'd like to call the business meeting of the Portland Board of Public Education to order. It is Tuesday, November 12th. Oh, it's not November 12th. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I'm reading instead of paying attention to reality. <laughs> it is February 4th, 2020, and the Portland Board of Public Education is meeting in Casco Bay High School in the Great Space. May I please ask the superintendent to call the roll? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, Mr. Atkinson. Here. Mr. Balfonts. Here. Ms. Bondo. Present. Mr. Burke. Here. Ms. Figdor. Here. Ms. Morioni. Here. Ms. Thompson. Here. Ms. Trevorrow. Here. Ms. Brown. Here. Mr. Casiel Reyes. Here. Ms. Habibasai. Here. Mr. Parrott. Here. Ms. Yangala. Here. And Chair Rodriguez. Presente. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just mess with me. Disoriented. Thank you. So I want to welcome everyone here. We have a, a pretty big crowd. We're going to start with a public hearing uh, on the renaming of the Riverton Elementary School as Gerald E. Talbot Community School. Um, I want to just go really quickly over the um, public comment rules, and then we'll get started. Um, anyone that's w that wishes to address the board, please, I'm going to ask that they come up to the podium. You'll have three minutes to speak. If you could, if you don't mind, please starting with your name and your address. Uh, as you get to the three-minute mark, I'll probably, uh, as politely as possible, interrupt you. If you need additional time, the board can grant that. We do have a pretty big crowd, so we're hoping that that we can limit it to three minutes so that everyone has the time, or rather, has an opportunity to speak without having to stay here longer than than we have to. All comments should be directed to the chair and not individually to any board members. And um, I think that covers it. All right. So if anyone wishes to address the board, please come up to the podium. And everyone else, line up. please line up so that we can get um, one after the other as quickly as possible. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Mr. President, I'm an academic, so three minutes is like a breath for me. <laughs> I have no idea what three minutes means in terms of, of a speech. Good evening. My name is Abraham Peck, and I am research professor of history at the University of Southern Maine and a lecturer in history at Bates College. I'm grateful to the board for allowing the Greater Portland community the opportunity to speak on behalf of the renaming of the Riverton Elementary School in honor of Gerald Talbot. I feel like a member of the Talbot family because in the nine generations that the Talbot name has been a part of China, Palmyra, Bangor, and Portland, Nine generations, they must love Maine winters. <laughs> there has been more than one Abraham among them, so my name is among that family quite well. So if you're like me and you've taken a car or a bus trip outside of the state, you find a certain comfort about halfway over the bridge from New Hampshire or from Canada seeing the word Maine, right? And a sign that tells you that this state is the way life should be. Yeah? But I think it's necessary to add an asterisk to that sign that says in quotes, but not for all Mainers. Certainly that was the case on July 4th, 1886, when Portland celebrated its centenary on July 4th, 1886. And at that parade, lots of people at that parade, the Reverend J.G. Wilson representing the Abyssinian Church, one of the first black churches in America, spoke of a Portland past that included slavery, physical violence, and religious and racial exclusion. No less appalling was the history of the Roman Catholic presence, recounted by Bishop James Augustine Healy of Portland. And he said, and I quote, in those days, the 1840s and 1850s, it was difficult, almost dangerous, to show a kind of face or fair dealing to Catholics. And he concluded his remarks saying, let us remember when the name Catholic was like a badge of agnomy in our town but he was less frank and with good reason about his racial background, which was one half African American, the result of his mother's status as a slave in Georgia. 
Let's just move very quickly, because I know I'm, I'm, the time is, is important, to a meeting of the Portland chapter of the Ku Klux Klan in 1923, a time when the Klan was both a local and national power and was poised to rid Portland politics of any Jewish or Catholic presence. The meeting was held at Klan headquarters just up the street from here on Forest Avenue, if you didn't know that. The Klan's flamboyant head, a man named F. Eugene Farnsworth, addressed a challenge to the activities of the Klan by various local groups. And this is what he said. Gather together all the anti-Klan voices you can, Catholic, Negro, Jew, and Italian votes, all the gang, and I wouldn't give you 10 cents for the whole bunch. That was the attitude that remained for the most part until a young African-American, Gerald E. Talbot, Talbot, became involved in the civil rights movement. He was one of a handful of Mainers to join for the job, for the uh, March for Jobs and Freedom in Washington, D.C., along with the late and, and much lamented Rabbi Harry Skye in 1963, when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his stirring I Have a Dream speech. That also became the dream of Jerry Talbot who in 1964 helped to reorganize the Portland branch of the NAACP and was elected to the first of his three stints as its president. That year, he also joined the voter registration drive in Mississippi. May, well, may I ask for I'm a little more time? Thank you. And there's no quiz after this. Uh, <laughs> and he became a key figure in helping to get Maine's Fair Housing Act passed in 1965. Wanting to do even more, Gerald Talbot ran in 1972 for the House of Representatives as an at-large delegate from Portland, becoming the first African American to be elected to the Maine legislature. He was re-elected again in 1974 and 1976. Now, one of his first objectives was to rid the state, this state, of place names whose main feature was the use of the N-word as a way of subtly robbing African Americans in Maine of their dignity and of their humanity. After several tri uh, tries, a bill that Jerry Talbot sponsored an act to prohibit the use of offensive names for geographic features and other places in the state of Maine was finally passed. But you know, Jerry Talbot was not a one single issue legislator. He spoke up for the rights of Maine Native Americans, people with low incomes, the gay community, and sought to educate the Maine State Legislature on what it meant to be a minority in Maine. His co-sponsorship of the bill, Sexual or Affectionate Preference, in 1977, an amendment to the Maine Human Rights Act, was extraordinary, opening the way for the gay community to begin to have a sense of protection from forces, sources and forces that were not favorable to it. Jerry Talbot also was the first black chairperson of a legislative committee, the Human Resource Committee, two terms, the first black speaker pro tem of the House of Representatives. He served on the Maine State Committee on Aging and later served on Minority Affairs for the American Association of Retired People, AARP. Most of you are too young to be membership. It's coming. <laughs> both in Maine and nationally. In 1980, Talbot was given the Jefferson Award as the candidate performing, as I quote, the greatest public service by an elected or appointed official, and was appointed to the Maine State Board of Education by then Governor Joe Brennan. Four years later, he was elected by the board as its chair. I'm coming to an end. So look, my dear friends on this board, who I think are doing a great job making Portland into a place of education for so many different groups of people. At a time when so many names and statues are being removed from public institutions and places for participating in America's shame of slavery and Jim Crow and its near genocidal efforts to destroy its Native American community, I think it's time, I hope you'll agree, to rename Riverton Elementary School with one that will bring dignity and pride to Portland and to the students who will enter that school a school bearing the name Gerald E. Talbot, who has brought this city and this state that much closer to being the way life should be in Maine. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? And if we don't mind lining up so that we can get a, a momentum, a bit of momentum going. <laughs> My name is June McKenzie. I'm 90 years old, and I'm Gerald Talbot's buddy. <laughs> I'd like to 
tell you, uh, he gave you, Abraham gave you all the information that I was going to give. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but uh, I grew up in Portland, and all my years, my mother graduated from Portland High, and all my eight kids graduated from Portland High, and uh, we never learned anything about our history when we were growing up in Portland, and you had to get out somewhere and read it, go to libraries, and until I was grown, I never knew that I was a part of such a great band of people. And I wanted, the only time we ever heard of anybody of color, it was if they got in trouble, they'd put it in the paper. But they wouldn't put anything good that you did. Or if they put anything good that you did in the paper, they would never mention that you were of a color. And I've been colored in black and the N-word and everything you can think of. And I think it's time that something in our city is named for the original people here. It's just time. And uh, um, we did a lot of things during the Civil Rights Movement. We marched and cried and died and prayed and did everything to make Portland a better place. Like, like he said that Jerry was the one that started the Fair Housing Act and a lot of other things. And we, did, we got out there and did it day after day, week after week, year after year, with no thought of being paid for it, but just to make things better for our kids and your kids. So I think it's time that the city of Portland recognizes one of our own before we're gone. So it, it would be wonderful if you could name that school the Gerald E. Talbot Elementary School because it's time we got recognition and Gerald's the best person that could do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you need copies? Mm -hmm. yes. Do you need the copies? I don't. We don't need it, but you're more. I mean, we'd love to have it if you if you want to pass them. Thank you. Good evening. On behalf of the board and the 60 plus members of the Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition, with a commitment to advancing systematic change, equity in Maine, through collaborative advocacy for policy development at state level and city level, my name is Mufalo. And I stand here to testify in support of renaming Riverton Elementary School. Merck values the diversity and mutual respect of its members as its greatest strength. Mr. Jared Tabot has been an activist for his entire life. He re-established the Greater Portland NWCP after attending the march in Washington. He was the first African-American elected to the main legislation. After six years in the legislature, he was appointed to the State Board of Education, where he continued to ensure that disenchantized sorry, <laughs> communities had access to, the quali to quality education. Sorry about that. Given Merck's mission and values, I stand here in support to rename Riverton School after Mr. Tabot, a man who has accomplished so much and has made such positive differences in all residents of men. He fought for fair housing, <coughs> equal employment opportunities, voting rights, disability rights, and LGBT rights. A man who has paved the way for an organization like Merck and a person as a person of color, I would not be able to lead such an immigrant rights organization in Maine without such a trailblazer. Mr. Tabon has caved a hard-won legacy in the framework of Maine State as it stands today.
He has fought and sacrificed so that human rights would never be denied. Diversity would be cherished in its strength. And so that democracy can continue to reign in America and in all men's residents. Please join me today and the Merck organizations touched by Mr. Tabot legacy and cast your vote today in renaming Riverton to Gerard E. Tabot Elementary School. Thank you. My name is David Hanworker. I live at 64 University Street, a stone's throw from here. And I too want to add my voice in favor of renaming the school for Gerald Talbot. And I too agree that it's way overdue to do it. This man is a hero, the state of Maine, and our country needs a lot more people like Gerald Talbot. And um, people have talked about the march in Washington in 63 where Jerry went. And he heard it loud and clear. And when Martin talked about his four young children being judged by the quality of their character, not by the color of their skin, I'm sure Martin, I'm sure Jerry heard that too. And the man has spent his whole life educating people and opening their minds to what's really going on in the world we live in, and not some make-believe, made-up facts. So, please, Gerald Talbot, having a school named after him is the right thing to do. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dennis Ross. I'm, direct I'm director of WJZP. Dot org 107.9 FM Portland 22 years in the community here in Portland and uh, the reason that I'm saying that is I'm standing here in support also in terms of Mr. Talbot in the sense of being the first at doing anything um, WJZP is the only minority owned and operated media outlet in New England and as a result of that I've known Mr. Talbot for over 25 30 years and as a result of that Part of the inspiration of me being where I am in terms of uh, coordinating and developing a uh, radio station, which is a big deal for the minority community, any minority community in the country. And as a result of that, the inspiration came from Mr. Talbot. And uh, I stand here in support of Mr. Talbot's school being named after Mr. Talbot in the sense of inspiration, new generation of kids coming up and growing up that have a modern day hero to look forward to, that can identify with and that can, you know, touch and still feel hands on and can still learn. And I stand here in support. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on in. There you go. Good afternoon. My name is Walter Phillips. And the reason why I'm here, I'm in support of Mr. Talbot having the school named after him. I'm an individual that's been walking in and out of Riverton School for like over 30 something years. And I walk in that, particular, in particular in the gym now, I refereed basketball that probably has some of you guys kids or grandkids all right and the dynamics of the, the diversity of that school has changed over the decades I could tell you that right now and I've seen kids come in and out of there in and out of there and a lot of them don't look like kids like that were there when I first started at Riverton so it would be a very 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 good thing for you guys to sit up at, at the table here and come to a conclusion and name Riverton School after Gerald Talbot because there is no other schools that's going to be named after Gerald Talbot in Maine. And Portland is the most diverse place in the state. I referee a lot of sports. I go all over the state. And whenever I bring up Gerald Talbot's name from Aroostook County down to Knox County, they know him. 
So you guys really need to come to some conclusion and name that school after Gerald Talbot. Because if you don't, you you might regret it. <laughs> okay, because there is, you know, there's schools named after other people in this state who are really, really not good characters, but we'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, but you guys got an opportunity to do what's right here and name that school after Gerald Talbot. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Erica King, and I live at 15 Catherine Street in Portland, and I'm here to lend my voice in support of the renaming of Riverton School to after Gerald Talbert. He is a hero. I think other people have done a very beautiful job of laying out his many, many contributions, and I would say that there is no other man or family that has delivered on Portland's promise more than he has. Um, his work in his portfolio is immense, and it lives on through his daughters, through his son-in-laws, through his grandsons and grandchildren who coach my children and support them in school, in public, Portland public schools and in public life in Maine every day. Um, this is a really important vote, and I look forward to celebrating this with you. Hello, uh, John Thibodeau, 114 Clinton Street. Um, hard to add to um, these incredible speakers before, so I'll just keep it short. Um, I'm John Thibodeau, I'm from Equity in Portland Schools, and this is just a, a tremendous opportunity for the city and for the community to, to really honor uh, a civil rights legend for a city and the state. And so I hope you take this opportunity. I think it's so important as our schools are so diverse now, which is wonderful. And we need to be having more adults that are uh, in our schools, either spiritually or figuratively, who are also of color too, um, and more teachers as well. But this is a great opportunity. I hope you take it. Thanks. Hi, good evening. My name is Jess Ellis. I am a president at 103 Walcott Street, and I am a teacher at Riverton Elementary, and I'm used to teaching, uh, to talking to 10-year-olds, so I'm gonna use my note, notes. Um, so I'm here tonight to, actually, to advocate for my students and families who have expressed concern about the proposed name change. I am a recent transplant to Portland. I'm from Prince George's County, Maryland, and I'm a new teacher to, the Portland, to Portland schools. I have had the great fortune of landing a, a job teaching fifth grade at Riverton Elementary School this year under the leadership of Ann Hanna. It is a joyous, rigorous, wonderful place to work, and I've never felt more supported in my 15 years as an educator, so thank you for this opportunity. I moved my family to Portland specifically because of the Portland Promise and this district's commitment to equity. Uh, when Principal Hanna announced the, the proposed name change, I was thrilled. I would be more than honored to teach at a school that is named for a civil rights leader such as Gerald E. Talbot, and the more I learn about his life and work, the more strongly I feel, uh, feel in support of that change. However, my students have felt quite differently. They, who, my students who are majority children of color were, are passionately opposed to a name change of any sort. They don't want any kind of change. Um, they love their school, and their school is named Riverton. Uh, many members of the community have felt similarly. Just to learn that the name of their beloved school could be changed without consulting them. Ten-year-olds would like to be consulted on every decision. Um, it is their school, after all. So I'm here tonight to express the opinion that an elementary school is not just a place where we learn, it's a place where we grow up. An elementary school is a home. It is, um, so changing the name of a school is like changing the name of a hometown. It's a big deal for the members of the community with whom I work every day. Uh, the children, my students, have spent the last week uh, studying the life and work of Mr. Talbot. It's been a real joy engaging in conversations with them as they contemplate the meaning of change, uh, the importance of a name, and why it would be a true honor to sacrifice the name of their dear school. 
uh, in, uh, in in an honor that it would be to be named after Gerald E. Talbot. Um, and I believe the needle is is moving, um, but it is a process, and it takes uh, conversation, it takes uh, education, and it takes in community engagement. <coughs> So I'm speaking tonight because I feel that a name change is important, that this one in particular would be, would be certainly beneficial and good and um, positive for our community, but it will be a hard one for the many, many families who have called Riverton home for multiple generations. Um, my students would like to send you their PowerPoint presentations Next week, we couldn't finish them for tonight. Um, but I'm here just to encourage you to be considerate, thoughtful, and assertive in engaging the Riverton community in this name change. Moving forward, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, and thank you for this opportunity. I am Andy Grinnell. I live uh, just over the fence, as it were, in the condominium at uh, 43 uh, De uh, Delaware Court. For two decades or more, Gerald Talbot worked to make the African American experience and history in the state visible and succeeded in producing a book of surprising and great length, uh, along with Harriet Noyes. I can't think of any. I can't think of anything that we could do to honor that effort, or to continue this process of making the invisible history visible, by naming this school in honor of Gerald E. Talbot. So thank you. Good evening. I'm Janet Kaner. I actually am a resident of Westbrook, but I'm a former uh, resident of Portland. My son went to school uh, from kindergarten through high school in Portland. And I'm here, I think, just to echo what's already been said about Mr. Talbot, but also as an educator for 30 years to, to also think about the kids who go to school here and think about uh, what better person to emulate than a man like Jerry Talbot, who has lived his life with such integrity, with such honesty, with such great work ethic, with such great patience, with such great tolerance. Um, and what a better model, role model for the kids here to have uh, than Mr. Talbot. So that's all I want to add. Yeah. anyone else good evening my name is Daoud Omar I'm here to uh, support the uh, renaming of Riverton School uh, after uh, Mr. Gerald Talbot I am um, standing back there thinking and um, I said one of the things I got here a little bit late but I don't know if anybody had actually mentioned the fact that um, Mr. Talbot family been here in this state long before the state had became a state. So that's some history that says that they have some belonging here. Um, and then I had the pleasure to actually work with Mr. Talbot after he was in a car accident and got to know him a little bit, little bit better. And um, one of the things that he actually you know, shared with me and um, I think it should be said here is that um, he did serve in the military, you know, because I'm a military guy. I was in the Air Force. I was in the first Gulf War. And when he identified the fact that he was in the military, it seemed like there was a bond there that you kind of get. And it comes from, I don't know, at least for myself, I know that um, you take a pledge to defend this country from foreign and domestic enemies. And being in the military, I don't know if Mr. Talbot actually was in war, but he was in the Korean War era. So that means he was willing to leave the country and go and serve and protect the country from whatever enemies that may have been out there. 
But at the same time, he had to come back to this state from which he was born and his family was raised here and was in existence long before it became a state and he had to fight on his own to deliver the message around the state that African Americans had some importance in this country. In this state, they have some importance. And I think for it to come back around full circle to mention or either the changing of a school name, I was reading the definition of American uh, from 1828, Webster's Dictionary. It says, uh, an American, a native of America, originally applied to the Aborigines, copper-colored races, found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of the Europeans. With that being said, I think um, not only does it make Mr. Talbot a real true America in the sense that he was willing to serve, but from that definition, it gives him the idea that these are the people that was on this property long before. So naming the school after him here in Portland, I think it would be an honor for the state and the city to say, yes, we want to take this on and see this man as a true American hero. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I'm Monica Bradley. I'm Gerald Talbot's granddaughter, and I am in full support of the name change of Riverend School to Gerald E. Talbot Elementary School. Um, I was born and raised in Portland, uh, and I actually went to Holland Elementary School, which was recently renamed as well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I actually knew the nurse that the name got changed to, and I got to experience her every day. I went to school when she was there, and she really inspired me. Um, and <clears throat> I was in full support of that name change. And I feel like the kids at Riverton Elementary School, um, because my grandfather is still here, um, <clears throat> they can be inspired by him just like I was inspired by Mrs. Rowe. And um, basically what I'm trying to say is uh, the kids can really be inspired by somebody who has been such a support to um, all communities. So thank you. Is, if there's anyone else, and just in the interest of time, if anyone else that wants to address the board, if we can line up um, behind the podium. Nobody? If, if there isn't anyone else to address the board, um, we'll get ready to close the public comment or uh, end the public hearing. So if, if you do want to address the board, this is your final call. All right, so seeing none, we'll finish the public comment part. Um, before we move on, I just want to take a quick um, survey around the board if we can take this item out of order in the agenda so we can work on the um, action uh, to, to vote on the renaming and you know, spare people having to sit through a long meeting before we get to it. Um, so I'm just seeing a lot of nods. I'm assuming everyone's fine with it. So having said that, consideration and action to rename Riverton Elementary School as Gerald E. Talbot Community School. Is there a motion? Ms. Morioni, second by Mr. Balfons. Will the superintendent please speak to the motion? With pleasure, um, Chair Rodriguez. As we kick off African American History Month, I'm proud to recommend to you that you approve an action to name the Riverton Elementary School in honor of a man who is living African American history, Gerald E. Talbot. In February of last year, the City Council wrote to this board asking that you consider renaming one of our schools in honor of Mr. Talbot. In May, the board approved a resolution highlighting the many contributions of Mr. Talbot to the history of Portland and Maine, including his service as the first African-American elected to the Maine legislature and to serve as chair of the State Board of Education. His contributions to equity in Maine, 
not just for African Americans, but as we heard earlier, for all people, including indigenous people and LGBTQ Mainers. That resolution charged the board chair to work with me to design and implement a process consistent with applicable provisions of our policy FF naming facilities to review existing facilities that could be renamed in a process for community engagement and dialogue on the potential naming. On January 7th, I made a recommendation to rename Riverton Elementary School for Mr. Talbot. On January 21st, we had a workshop along with the first reading of the recommendation. As a result of that workshop, we hosted a community meeting last week at Riverton that was attended by about 50 people. Based on feedback that we received at that meeting, we amended the resolution as follows, whereas in response to community engagement, including a community meeting held on January 30th, the superintendent revised his recommendation to rename Riverton Elementary School as the Gerald E. Talbot Community School in recognition of the Riverton Elementary School's work to implement the community school model and have that reflected in their name. This is reflected in the action resolution that's in your packet. The reason for this change is based on the feedback that we received at the Riverton meeting last week, where participants were generally supportive of the name, definitely understood the importance of honoring Mr. Talbot, and saw the potential for future generations of Riverton students to identify with Mr. Talbot's groundbreaking and courageous work. We also heard a sentiment that the school which has served as a center for the community for almost 100 years, ought not lose that connection to the Riverton community. The school has been working aggressively to not lose its connection to the community. In fact, last year, Riverton received funding from the John T. Gorman Foundation to explore becoming a true community school. This funding has supported the ongoing work to bring together resource providers from throughout the Riverton community to discuss how to work more closely together and use the school as the hub for their services. The school's link to its community has never been stronger and it will continue to strengthen as a result of the work of Principal Hannah and the community school exploration team, which includes multiple partners from Riverton and the larger Portland community. So today, consistent with board policy FF, we're holding, we held this public hearing on the name change, and now we're asking you to vote on this recommendation. If it's approved, we will proceed with the next steps, which include formally notifying the city of, and the state of the name change, and we envision finishing this year as the Riverton Elementary School and beginning the 2021 20, school year with a new name. That will allow us the time to affect the physical changes that are required, such as the notification and the sign and again, I couldn't be prouder for the students in this school district, the students at the current Riverton Elementary, to grow up and get their education at a school named after Mr. Talbot. So with that. Thank you, Superintendent. Are there any questions on the motion? I have a couple of questions. <laughs> Um, for the interest in the interest to be uh, really uh, clear with the community and, and for transparency, um, Superintendent, the community center aspect of the building, that the name will remain Riverton Community Center. Is that accurate? We don't. Um, that is a city building. So if there were, were to be a change to that, it would be as a result of city action. Yep. Same thing applies for the library, the, Pol the Portland Public Library that's housed in the, in the school, correct? That's right. All right. And the pool. The community pool has a name as well. That would remain what it currently is, which skips my mind right now. Okay. Um, the reason I ask these questions is because these are things that have been brought up by the community members um, who have expressed some, um, uh, how do you say, some connection to the identity of the name of Riverton and what it means to that community. Um, so I, I want to be clear that we're not eliminating the name Riverton from what takes place in that facility. Um, and one last question that has been brought up, um, are there any costs associated with the name? So the most significant cost associated with the name is um, a new sign. Um, I do want to point out, and we discussed this during the workshop, so the board is aware of the fact that we were already in the process of looking um, to get a new sign for the building because of the work that's happening with the school becoming a community school. So there was an interest to have community 
reflected in the sign that welcomes people to the building. So that was one of the reasons that, um, that we thought that this made a lot of sense and also why it makes sense for us to um, now name it the Gerald E. Talbot Community School. Good. And the, my understanding is that the sign, the, I'm sorry if I skipped it right now, um, we try to do some fundraising to cover the cost of the sign as well. Yeah. Excellent. Um, those are all the questions I have. But we're, we're, we'll give me just a second, Ms. Bondo. Um, so we, we just heard public comment from, uh, from the community. So I'm assuming we're not going to ask for if there's public comment, and so we'll move to board discussion. Uh, Ms. Bondo, you have the floor. I just have uh, my thoughts Then I would like to add before to cast my vote. I would like to acknowledge the process because this is a valuable step to recognize a civil rights activist in our public school system. We all know that we still have a long way to go for bridging the gap of teaching diversity as staff in our district and state. But I strongly believe that the diversity of thinking, backgrounds, expertise will improve our student learning process. With almost 33% of our students have a primary language, 60 languages are spoken. We as a board of education leadership administrator, have to reflect on it and find ways to invest in those areas of growth and value the richness of our diverse culture. The Wabanaki studies in our social studies is one of the examples to impact our students about race and to remove the stigma of a single story. One quote from my favorite African writer, Chimamande Gozi, I said, and I quote, stories can break the dignity of a people, but also stories can repair that broken dignity. We are moving to that direction by renaming one of our schools to reflect the legacy of Mr. Talbo. African-American studies should be the next chapter, and I will cast my vote for yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bono. Is there, other, is there any other board discussion? Ms. Morioni, you have the floor. So as many of you know, this is my, I'm going into my 12th year on the school board, Portland School Board. And over the years, I have worked with the Talbot sisters um, primarily, um, have met Mr. Talbot. Um, and there are times over these years where I am wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly in support of a vote in favor of renaming Riverton School. I, I'm just thrilled for this opportunity to cast my vote. I can't say that about all the times we've had to vote, but I just, I just want to say thank you to the Talbot family. Thank you for supporting the, all of the hard work in our state. Um, I see it every day with my own sons on their basketball team and the diversity that's reflected in their classrooms that's reflected in the teachers that speak about diversity and, and bringing them together and united. I'm so proud to cast my vote tonight. So thank you for all of your hard work. I can't even imagine all the years of dedication you've, you've put forward. And I just want to say thank you. And so I'm looking forward to casting my vote. Yes. Thank you. Any other board discussion? Ms. Victor and then Mr. Burke. Um, I truly am humbled to have the opportunity to name one of our schools after Jerry Talbot. Um, I think that um, in this day and age, we it, it's so important to have role models to look up to um, and to be able to help um, educate the Portland community and our students about the incredible life um, and legacy that Mr. Talbot leaves us and and has has created for all of us, um, for um, all of us who live in Portland and Maine. I think this is just an incredible opportunity. Um, and I am I'm really excited to start to talk about the Gerald E. Talbot Community School. It doesn't yet flow off my tongue, but it soon will. 
Um, and um, I know this has been a long process. It's taken us about a year. And I want to thank you all for sticking um, with it um, and for your patience. Um, I know this is a, you know, this reflects a lifelong, um, a, 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 um, a, a life of, of um, patience and hard work and integrity and community. Um, and um, I am so honored to be a part of this decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Burke, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say I'm f in full support of the renaming for all the reasons mentioned here tonight, uh, as do the majority of constituents in District 3 that have responded to me. Uh, it's absolutely the right thing to do. I also want to acknowledge that I heard the students at Riverton that trusted their teacher to speak for them tonight. Uh, and I want to say you were heard. And I hope you'll trust us that this is a good change and something we'll all be proud of, uh, assuming this vote goes through. I also want to say I agree that the process can be improved to ensure those that are most affected by major changes like this, particularly students, uh, are engaged earlier and have time uh, to be heard. Uh, again, I fully support the renaming of the school to the Gerald E. Talbot Community School, and thank you to Mr. Talbot. Uh, Ms. Brown, you have the floor. Um, I just want to... <clears throat> Sorry, I just wanted to add that one of the greatest things that I found of growing up in this Portland education system is the diversity that we have. And I think that renaming Riverton to honor um, one of the civil rights leaders, Gerald E. Talbot, is a really great reflection of that diversity that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. <laughs> Borrow. So I'll be brief because I think that the contributions that Mr. Talbot has made to this community have been well outlined throughout this process and in our resolution and in the public comments here tonight. Um, I echo the sentiments that this is important to the education of our students um, in bringing a history to our students that um, hasn't always been taught in traditional education. And I want that for, for our kids. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Talbot, you are clearly a hero of this community. And as a board member, I am honored to be able to commemorate your legacy with this vote tonight. Thank you. Um, we'll go Ms. Mangala and then Ms. Thompson. You, you can. Uh, for me, I'm so happy to share um, and humble enough to be among all these people who are making the change and like voting for this change. And I did have a conversation with Portland adult education teachers. So I think it's a very good change. And I have my sympathy for all those students and the community that may feel that this school is not going to be a part of them. But even if they change, they change it for someone who was very good and it's going to be still your school and your neighborhood. So I'm so happy that this change is going to be made. Ms. Thompson. Thank you. So many of you know I'm a native Portlander, um, but I'm also the daughter of a former Portland historian um, who Mr. Beck, uh, Mr. Peck um, knew quite well. Um, and going through dad's work and collections and reading um, papers, newspapers that he collected um, from back when the um, papers started being printed in this area and just going through things, I've, I've really enjoyed um, reading all the things that I, I had no idea about and I have so much to learn. Um, about Portland, and um, but there were so many references um, to Mr. Talbot and some of Dad's work, and um, and how he helped to make Portland the special place um, we are. There's been so many um, contributions, and you've paved many paths. Um, you're a role model for all, advocate for all, and truly inspirational. So I'm happy to uh, vote in favor. Thank you very much. Ms. Happy son. Um, I just wanted to also mention that as a student, a part of the Portland public school system, I'm so honored to be a part of this process in renaming Riverton Elementary School after Mr. Talbot. Um, I think 
I can speak for almost all of the Portland Public School students in saying that this is a step that is so um, something that should be very um, remembered among all of our students. Um, it's so special to be a part of this um, honestly to me like historic step. I, I, only f I, I feel so honored to be a part of this process and to be able to say that um, you know I was a part of something so special to the Portland Public Schools community. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll add. Um, you know, we, we heard a lot of, you know, excellent reasons of why it's so important to recognize Mr. Talbot. And, and I 100% agree with everything that was said. I mean, his, his record speaks for itself. Um, I wanted to, to say that when this first came up to the board, and I've mentioned this before, um, I, I, I had, at that point, I had never met Mr. Talbot. So I, I, I said, you know, I really want to, if, if we're going to move this forward, I want to be able to meet Mr. Talbot and the family. And, and, and they invited me to their home. And we spent an afternoon chatting, and they shared stories. Um, I learned so much uh, about him as, a, as an individual. And the gentleman that earlier mentioned the connection, the immediate connection after learning that he was in the military, I shared that too. And, I, and, and that is really unique. And, and we connected right away. And then being an elected official, same thing. It was like, I, I, I can see how when your values and when your morality is represented through your work and you're proud of it, and, and geez, I've been doing this for four years, so I won't even try to compare what I've done to what Mr. Tabo has done. But, it, but what a role model to me. In, in, in the life that I've started as a, as a public servant. Um, so it's, it's, I'm honored also to have this opportunity to cast this vote. Um, from a representation point of view, I wanted to share that when I first moved to Maine, or ahead of moving to Maine, like most people, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at data, I'm looking at Wikipedia pages, and I, you know, because you hear that Maine is the whitest state in, in, this, in the union. And, um, you know, and that's for, for when you come from where I, where I come from and, and you're about to move to a place like this, that's, that's weird. Like, there's just no way around it. It is. Because you see something like 98% of the state is white, um, but it doesn't hit you till you get here. So you get here and you walk around and you go through the mall, you, go, you drive around cities, and, and, and you honestly, you don't see yourself. And that's the first time that that ever happened in my life. And so to, to start to learn of the history that African Americans have had in this state, to, to start to then get to know them, and I've, got, and I've had a chance to meet the family a little bit better, and um, I, see, I see Rachel back there. Rachel and I have had some incredible conversations together, and she knows she's my sister, and I love her so much. And, 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 and to make those connections for someone that comes from, from outside of Maine, and, and to see the value that the African Americans have had in this state, like, it, th there's no better way to help you than belong or feel like you belong here. Uh, earlier tonight, I was part of this uh, interview, this video that we're trying to do to try to recruit more educators of color to come into Portland Public Schools because we know how valuable it is to diversify our teacher workforce. And man, how, how much, like what, what better message can we send as a district of how much we value diversity than by recognizing one of the greatest leaders in, in this state that happens to be an African American. Because he's not just a great African American leader, he's a great leader, period. It just so happens that he's an African American. I'm, I'm more than thrilled, I'm honored for the vote that we're about to cast. So having said that, <clears throat> consideration and action to rename Riverton Elementary School as Gerald E. Talbot Community School. All those in favor, please indicate. And that's unanimous with the students voting with a majority. one last thing 
Um, we're honored that Mr. Talbot is here with us today. Oh my God, this is so good. And if, without any pressure, of course, if there was anything that you wish to say or, or to address us, um, you, you're m obviously more than welcome to do so. <laughs> wow, this is so beautiful. <laughs> <coughs> Good evening. A long way. <laughs> That's as fast as I can move now. <laughs> Superintendent Boswana, Chairman of the Board and the Board, and all the students. Thank you so very, very much. I just, I never, ever thought that I would be here or they would be here together, and I would be getting what I'm getting. It's just, and the children, they got everything going for them. And they're dreaming. And that's what you gotta do. Because they got a dream so they can be here one day also. Thank you, thank you so very much. I didn't dream, I did not think, I thought it was impossible to be here. I just, I just thought it was impossible. And then as I went through what I had gone through and I worked what I had to do, I would one day say, well, wait a minute now, I did all that, how come I wasn't arrested? <laughs> How come? <laughs> like all of you, <laughs> you just try to do what you can possibly do. And you go from day to day to day to day, and you dream. Don't stop dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. Dream. And one day, all of you and the students will one day in, be in the position that I am now. Thank you so very, very much for it. Thank you. Here's my buddy. <laughs> I'm just stopping myself from crying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank you for everything. And don't forget the kids coming up. They were an education. Thank you for giving them. <laughs> Thank you again. Right. <laughs> You okay? Uh, you okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Grandpa. <laughs> Grandpa, where does your grandson go to school? My grandson is. Your great-grandson. Great great huh? Where does your great-grandson go to school now? Where does your great-grandson go to school now? <laughs> Believe that or not, <laughs> my great-grandson. Where does he go to school Demetrius. now? What school do you go to? Riverdale. <laughs> no. No, you don't. Can you tell them? Can you tell them? No. No. <laughs> Until next year. 
I know. All right. Uh, next on our agenda, um, uh, real quick, for the remarks of the chair, uh, I just have a couple of quick um, uh, comments to make, or, or rather, thank you notes that I wanted to share with the community. Uh, a few events and a few, um, yeah, a few events that I was able to attend since our last meeting. Um, first of all, I wanted to send a really um, heartfelt thank you to our Poland High School Extended Learning Opportunities Coordinator, Andrea Levinsky. Um, she uh, invited me and about 25 other um, community members to be panelists uh, and speak with ninth graders uh, about our work experience, our careers, and um, our just overall to share with them what, um, how our path has been, what path we've taken uh, professionally. Uh, this is part, if you guys remember, two years ago, we added the ALO coordinators into our budget, and it's part of our youth development programming and something that I was a strong advocate for. And every time that I've been invited to the schools, I really try to make the time to be there. Um, I'm incredibly thankful that there were, like I said, over 25 community members there, and the kids, the, the ninth graders were incredible. They, they were asking great questions. Um, I hope that we were able to share with them um, a, a picture of all the different opportunities that they have to create their careers and I hope that we were able to give them some positive advice that they can then take on as they try, you know, try to navigate how they're going to develop their professional careers. Um, so again, thank you for that. Um, on Thursday of last week, on January 30th, um, I was invited to King Middle School and I, was just, I sat on a panel uh, to, and I joined eighth graders uh, along with, uh, I think it was about seven other community members. This included a uh, city councilor from South Portland, a uh, ge gentleman that directs the work for Mano a Mano, which is an organization here in Maine. Um, we, we had an attorney from Drummond Woodson and several other folks. Um, and so we participated in discussions with eighth graders that were focused around uh, three, or rather around uh, central themes of how, do, how does racism and oppression affect happiness and well-being? Uh, how do personal responsibility and agency factor into happiness in the face of systemic oppression? And what can students do in areas of activism and social justice work? Um, these eighth graders were incredible. I mean, the, the, the level of insight that they were showing and the questions that they were raising and the com conversations that we were having. Um, I was excited to have been there. Um, I left there probably having learned more from these young people than I was probably able to project to them. Um, so again, I'm, I'm so I'm thrilled that we're in a community, in a school community, where these conversations are taking place and that the children uh, feel comfortable asking these difficult questions and navigating these really complex conversations. Um, so again, incredibly thankful for the opportunity to be there. And lastly, um, that same day on the 30th, in the evening, Thursday, in this very room, um, we had a workshop that was facilitated by the Greater Portland Council of, Govern of Governments um, they were discussing, discussing the root causes of the opioid use disorder, uh, st strategies for addressing the problem, identifying gaps in services. Um, we had local experts, including Portland Public Schools staff, um, uh, present information on prevention, harm reduction, enforcement, treatment, and recovery. Uh, obviously, the schools play a significant role in this work. And I was uh, grateful to be present for that workshop and, and to be part of the work that, that we're doing. Um, our community, uh, our nation is affected by this horrible problem. And so it's, it, it really does require having uh, all hands on deck uh, approach to finding solutions. Um, so obviously, we didn't fix the problem that evening, clearly. Um, but, but we engaged with some key stakeholders. Uh, and I was grateful to have been invited and be part of that. And um, uh, as much as I'm saddened by, by the reality of the problem that we're facing. Um, I'm excited that, that we are raising this level of awareness and that we're engaging with some of the key leaders in the city to find ways to meet those, uh, right, to fill those gaps and, and meet those needs. Um, that's all I have for today. Uh, next, for the report of the students, we have a Casco Bay High School report. So we have Mr. Fabio Casiel Reyes uh, presenting. Uh, Mr. Reyes, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, so beginning my report, on the 9th, 10th, and 12th of December, students who need to catch up on work did so during our program called Frost School. This program is basically um, the students stay after school to catch up on late and missing work. On the 12th as well, the 8th grade open house lasts from 6.30 to 8.30.
and on the following day, this, our seniors participate in an annual tradition where they march to the post office to deliver college applications or letters to people they appreciate. On the 17th, the sophomore class culminated their expedition beyond borders, where they conducted research about a country of their choice that is part of a global refugee crisis. Our junior, the juniors presented their presentations for public policy on the 17th and 19th at the Portland Public Library. On the 20th, the entire school gathered for the winter solstice, where we expressed gratitude for one another and teachers. And right after winter break on the 2nd of January, intensives began. Students participated in week-long curriculums where they focused on one topic. It could have been something as uh, weaving baskets, learning about the chemistry of candy, or making pottery, and many others. And on the 16th, we held a crew night where family and CBH as students were invited to Casco to eat, eat food and talk about uh, Casco Bay. And later in the month, on the 24th, the junior held a winter dance to raise money for their big sec expedition, which is coming up, uh, called Junior Journey. On the 24th, 27th, 28th, we welcomed eighth graders to our school to show them around with the guiding question of the day, what does it mean to be a Casco Bay student? And our mid year conferences were held on the 29th and 30th, and then the junior class began interviewing pe people in Portland on the 29th and 30th for their expedition, People of Portland Storytelling. Some upcoming events, the CBHS Film Festival is happening on the February 6th and 7th. Spirit Week, which is going to be next week on the February 10th. Winter Carnival, uh, February 14th, which is like kind of we gather around and we play games for to win a prize for all the crews. And the 8th grade commitment forum is due on the 14th as well. This concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia Reyes. Um, quick... <laughs> <laughs> You've got a fan base now. That's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, before I pass it on to the superintendent, I, I failed to include something in my remarks. I wanted to um, just send a reminder out there of the next parent university event uh, that's going to be held this Thursday, February 6th. It's starting from 5.30 p.m. at Lincoln Middle School, and the topic is Internet Security, Protecting Children from the Dangers of the Internet. Um, that's all I have. So I'll pass it on now for the report of the superintendent. Mr. Botano, you have the floor. Great. And um, I congratulations on your first, um, on your first uh, student report. That was awesome. Um, I would like to begin my comments today by recognizing the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy tribes, known collectively as the Wabanaki, or people of the Donland, the original inhabitants of the land on which our city and schools stand. And we're honored to have their children among our students in our schools today. I want to start with some good news. We received our EPS projections from the Department of Education, and it projects us receiving more money than we received last year. The current projection is for us to receive $650,000 more than what we received um, in, for the 2020 budget. Obviously, that's a huge turnaround from our projected loss of close to a million dollars. It appears that the shift is the result of a new way in which our staff reported teacher seniority. Previously, we had only reported their time of service in Portland Public Schools, but with new staff in HR and our new munis reporting, we used the staff's overall experience instead. Because staff seniority is factored into the EPS formula, this shift resulted in a significant increase in our staff seniority over the previous year. Revisions are still possible, so we're projecting the turnaround from our original projections to be between 1.2 and 1.4 million. It's important to understand that this is a one-time adjustment. The fundamental <coughs> underlying principles of increased valuation and local expectations hold true. We are working to revise our projections for FY21 for FY and beyond uh, prior to our February 14th Finance <coughs> Committee meeting, so that's next Thursday. We have scheduled a district advisory committee, district building advisory committee meeting for this Thursday evening. This is an, a very important meeting as it will review our preliminary estimates for construction costs. The meeting will be at 6 p.m. in the district central office. More good financial news. We received word this week that City Manager Jennings' final uh, FY21 uh, CIP recommended uh, recommendations was posted, and all of the school projects in our original request, with the exception of the circulation loop at Lyman Moore Lyseth, are included for a total request of approximately $3.8 million. This includes almost $2 million in state revolving loan funding that the state has notified us of um, that we are receiving as of today. 
And so I'm incredibly grateful to City Manager Jennings for support of our proposed CIP, and I look forward to continuing to work with the City Council as it reviews and hopefully approves this request. And just before we came here this afternoon, we also learned that we had been awarded $15,000 by the city from the funds that are allocated to Portland for supporting agencies that helped us serve last summer's influx of asylum seekers. You may have also heard about the Rue Institute Northeastern University partnerships um, unveiled, that was unveiled last week. We were subsequently approached by Educate Maine because the Rue family is interested in sponsoring coding programming for young women in the district. And our uh, STEM coordinator, Brooke Teller, who you'll hear from a little bit later, is coordinating our follow-up on this exciting opportunity. On Thursday, staff from the district and the Portland Police Department met to discuss the Department of Justice's new STOP grant for school safety. And I'm grateful to Portland Police Chief Frank Clark, who's assigned staff to help develop the application, which will focus on threat assessment training, bullying reporting, and mental health training. As part of our efforts to broaden our outreach and deepen our recruitment pool, Barb Stoddard and her team are scheduled to attend two job fairs in Boston, Harvard's Graduate School of Education's Recruitment Fair on February 26th, and then Met's Diversity, Ch Diversity Career Fair for educators on March 7th. We're also considering a visit to Teachers College at Columbia, at Columbia um, University in New York City and Rutgers Graduate School of Education in New Jersey, along with a visit to a few HBCUs in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm grateful to Barb and her team for their efforts to improve our staff diversity, and I'm hopeful that this type of recruitment will add more diversity to our hiring pool. And that concludes my report. And um, it would be appropriate to applaud now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're out of line. You know? uh, next for the consent items, will the superintendent please read the list of donations made to the district? Did we do the approval? Um, my not that approval. I don't know. Let's um, actually, before we get to the consent items um, for the, um, wow, look at that, it's not on the agenda. They're not loaded up. They're not here? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking because Are they not in there? they're not. Okay, all right. My, my for, yeah, for the apologies. minutes from last meeting are not here for us to approve today, so we'll, we'll make sure to include them in, um, for the agenda for next meeting. Uh, so we're back to the consent items. Um, Superintendent, mind reading the list of donations made to the district, please? Nope. Under board policy, KCD, the school board accepts by unanimous consent contributions made to the school district. As required by that policy, all of the donations are listed in the board agenda under this item. Our practice is for each donor to receive a written contribution acknowledgement expressing our heartfelt gratitude as well as for their tax purposes. And I would like to thank the many generous contributors to the Portland Public Schools who have made donations of durable goods, goods of substantial value and historical or, or commemorative significance. And the beneficiaries and contributors are the Gerald E. Talbot Community School uh -huh. received the following donations. Hannet mittens from Clark Memorial UMC of Portland, snow pants, gloves, clothes, and food from Karen Tonello of Scarborough, coats, snow pants, gloves, and mittens from Susanna Wood of Portland, a donation toward the playground from Lee Automals of Maine, stand-up workstation from Barry Dunn of Portland, winter clothing from Joe Bornstein of Portland, 70 bags of food and gloves from Morgan Stanley of Portland, another donation toward the playground from Gail Cressy of Portland. Gail is always on our agenda. <laughs> it's awesome, and for awesome things. <laughs> this is great. Um, and lasagna, salad, bread, and dessert from Wayside Food Programs of Portland. East End Community School received the following donations. Winter weather gear from St. Luke's Cathedral of Portland, winter <coughs> weather funds from Pike Industries of Fairfield, and winter clothing from the law offices of Joe Bornstein of Portland. Ocean Avenue Elementary School received donations toward the following. Books for the library from Berlin City of Portland. Continued work towards their international baccalaureate from 
Gail Cressy, <laughs> and student snack pantry from Pinecone and Chickadee of Portland. And the Breathe program received a timer, 16 colored pencils, and 32 fidgets from Leslie Humphreys and Dennis Messincini of Portland. And that's, um, we're very grateful to all of them for their generous support and contributions to the work of the Portland Public Schools. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, next, for uh, our <clears throat> board focus on educational issues, we have a district 2019 MEA analysis and update on core content work. Um, we're probably going to use the projection if you guys want to shift around. Up. Um, just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, today's board focus serves a dual purpose. On the one hand, we'll be walking you through the main educational assessment results for the district for 2019. Um, the main DOE released these results two weeks ago, and this is the fourth year of the MEA administration. As you will see, our data tracks closely with the state, and the fundamental point of our data is that there is, there continues to be a huge disparity in performance between different student populations that are based on their race, ethnicity, disability, or socioeconomic status. While I know that we're all skeptical of how accurately these types of assessments measure what our students know, there's sufficient evidence in many other areas, such as participation in advanced courses, discipline, and our student surveys to warrant our attention to it in this context. The second part of our board focus tonight will be related to what we are doing to improve our performance towards the achievement goal. Specifically, Assistant Superintendent Malia Nally and Curriculum Director Jesse Robinson, along with a cast of other district staff, um, will update us on <coughs> our core instruction work. As you know, throughout the fall, we've, had, we've been providing updates on our key investments. In the past couple of months, you've heard about our behavioral health continuum work, including the implementation of our new BREATHE program. You also heard a status update on a pre-kindergarten expansion. The core instruction update is the final update in the sequence as we head into our budget season. So we're going to begin with a review of our MEA data. Jamie Kearney, our data and reporting manager, and I are going to tag team a little bit on this with Jamie doing most of the hard lifting, which includes everything from getting the presentation ready to actually talking about the data. Um, and we will start today with a look um, at our overall comparison um, of performance to the state and to comparison districts. Then we're going to do a little bit of talking about the achievement gaps between our student groups. And as always, we'll benchmark ourselves against uh, comparison districts as well as the state and look at our gaps um, over time. And then the last thing we're going to do is review our school level performance. And here we're going to look at our school performance against the state as well as over time. And we'll highlight a couple of schools. but primarily because those will be featured in the core instruction uh, presentation that you will hear uh, later, led by uh, Assistant Superintendent Nally and her team. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Jamie. Okay. No, I think I just got a, okay. Um, the first thing that I just wanted to show is kind of showing how Portland Public Schools compares to the state as a whole. Um, our student population is much more ethnically and racially diverse than the state. Um, I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. Um, we're also, we have more students that are uh, economically disadvantaged than the state as a whole, Most more students that are homeless and more students that are English language learners than the state as a whole. So this is just general information to kind of show where Portland Public Schools kind of sits in comparison to the state, especially when we're, we're looking at achievement scores and the equity gap or the achievement gap and we're comparing that to the state. This is kind of to, to ground that conversation. Um, on the left are ELs, uh, ELA scores um, for the last four years. Uh, kind of throughout this presentation, Maine as a whole is in blue and Portland is in green. And you can see that we're tracking very, very similar um, across all four years. The same for, for math, which is on the right. There's just, there's, there's not a lot of difference in our scores and the state scores. And this next slide, um, just shows the actual trend lines, and you can see that um, 
I'm looking at this now and the colors are hard to see, but you can see that the lines are very close <laughs> to each other. So basically Portland Public Schools is tracking almost identically to what's happening at the state level. So overall EL scores are going up and overall math scores are, are slightly ticking down year after year. Um, this is the, how we compare kind of to our counterparts regionally and to other large schools. On the left, you'll see the schools that are around us. Um, underneath, it does show just, just to kind of, again, to, to ground this conversation, it shows the uh, percent of students that receive free or reduced lunch and the percent of students that are students of color in these districts. Um, and that's just to have that information. Portland is circled in orange. The two districts on the right are the other, the other large districts in the state of Maine. Um, Bangor is the, the district that compares to us uh, most similarly as far as economic status, the diversity in their students. And then Lewiston is the, the district that compares most similar, the district that's most similar to us as far as uh, racial and ethnic diversity. Um, same slide, this just shows, shows mass scores, but the, the overall picture is the same as far as where we stand. Um, now we're kind of getting into the actual, the question of equity and the achievement gap. Um, the blue lines, the light blue and the dark blue are the state scores. And this is the achievement gap for students of color versus white students. Um, the green lines are Portland Public Schools. So there is a very clear achievement gap at the state level and, and also within our district. And it's also very clear that the achievement gap within Portland Public Schools is much more significant than the gap seen statewide. Um, this holds true for, for ELA and it holds true for math. Um, we do have a, that, that gap is closed just a little bit in Portland Public Schools for ELA, um, but otherwise at the state level and within our district, there's, there's been no change. This, this gap is basically held steady for the last four years. And this is the same data based on um, economic status. And you can see that here, the, the gap is actually uh, even wider between students that are economically disadvantaged and those that are not. Um, a little bit of a mixed picture, the, the gap is decreasing a little bit in ELA, increasing a little bit in math, but, but really overall, the, the gap is flat. So these next couple slides, these are the comparison slides, just so you can see kind of how we compare to other districts. These are regional districts, so these are the school districts around us. Uh, the kind of the orange dotted line is the state average for economically disadvantaged students, and the blue dotted line is the state average for non-economically disadvantaged students. Um, the gist of this slide is, is the one on the right, the, the difference between those two groups of students that, that opportunity gap or achievement gap is most significant at Portland Public Schools, um, kind of hands down. Um, that's ELA. This is math and again, a very similar story. Um, if we look at the, the other large districts, the, we're, we're still, you know, our gap is much larger than other districts, either than Bangor or Lewiston, which in their own way serve a similar population. And that's math. <clears throat> so this slide looks at the actual outcomes of the MEA, the assessment scores, and um, kind of breaks, breaks down each kind of bucket, if you will. So on the far left, these are all the students that scored a one, well below state expectations. And in purple are economically disadvantaged students, and in yellow are non-economically disadvantaged students. And you can see that overwhelmingly, if you scored a one on the MEA, that you are economically disadvantaged. And on the other side of this, if you scored a four, if you were above state expectations, you were almost overwhelmingly a student that was not economically disadvantaged. And in math, this is most clear. State or district-wide, there were only 39 students who were economically disadvantaged that scored a four. Um, so you can almost be guaranteed that if you're economically disadvantaged, you will not score a four on math on the MEA. 
Can I just um, yeah. say something? We, we specifically included that number because I don't think that anybody um, can um, just like ignore the fact that we had 3,000 students roughly that took this exam and only, um, and half of those kids are economically disadvantaged in this district. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 uh, and you know 40 kids um, scored at that highest level. So this is something that I know since Jamie brought this to me um, has been seared in my consciousness and I hope that it is in everybody's consciousness because this is the, um, you know, obviously this is the work that we are um, committed to doing as a district and that we are not um, seeing the progress that we, um, that we want to see towards. And so I think that this number in particular is one that I just wanted to, you know, highlight. I think that you saw throughout these slides that our gap is the largest of any of our comparison districts. It's larger than the state. Um, again, none of that is new. I think you see that um, in general our students who are not uh, economically disadvantaged perform uh, very, uh, you know, uh, consistently with um, students from neighboring districts and you see where our achievement gap lies and so that is absolutely why um, the work that we do always leads with equity and how do we close those achievement gaps and those opportunity gaps that lead to the achievement gap and so I definitely want everybody to just take a moment and sort of let the 39 students sink in because that is something that is um, incredibly striking to me. And I also want people to take in just this pattern. I don't think it's necessarily surprising based on kind of years and years of research. Um, but as, as we go up from, you know, well below state expectations, below, at, and above, you know, the percent of students that are economically advantaged that fall into each of those categories like shrinks, but the percent of students that are not economic, it's, it's reverse. They keep growing and our students that are economically disadvantaged keep shrinking and I think this is really clear um, in this visual. Uh, so next we're gonna look at kind of elementary school. So um, the MEA starts in grade three, so it's elementary school, but it's grades three, four, and five. Um, and as was mentioned, the, the Empower Me assessment, um, we began using that assessment in 2016. So we're just looking at the 2016, the first year that we administered this through last year's administration. These are the trend lines. This is the, the state trend line for elementary schools versus Portland Public Schools, um, ELA on the left, math on the right. You can see math is almost identical and ELA is very close. This is gonna be something we see kind of over and over again that we're tracking almost identically to, to what's happening at the state level. Um, and again, ELA is, is slowly going up and math is slowly going down. <clears throat> uh, just a school by school comparison. So the, the gray bar represents that initial score in 2016 and the blue bar represents um, the score from 2019. For ELA, um, a lot of our schools, most of our schools have actually made some gains, um, and that, that does kind of reflect what we see at the state level. And then in math, most of our schools have, have lost ground, which is also reflective of what we see at the state level. Can I just um, yep. mention, so um, in, the, uh, in the next presentation, in the core instruction presentation, we're gonna highlight um, the work of Riverton and uh, Longfellow as part of the, uh, as part of our presentation in terms of um, some of the, the highlights, particularly in their connection to the core instruction work. So just wanted to highlight those. Um, and Longfellow, we're gonna be discussing math, which is this slide, and then Riverton, um, looking at the work that they've been doing in, in ELA, which we can see on, on this, Riverton's all the way on the right. And you can see that pretty significant jump. Um, for middle schools, middle level, um, this is really the one graph where we kind of deviate a little bit from the state. So we are making gains in ELA um, at the middle school level, but 
we're not making gains as fast as what's being seen uh, at the state level. Um, but again, we are making gains. And then math, we're tracking almost identically. We started out a little bit lower, and then our, our changes year over year are very similar. Um, the school by school comparison, this is ELA. Um, so most of the schools are, are uh, kind of making positive progress. Um, and then we have one school that's, that's flat over these four years, or from 2016 to 2019 in ELA. And then in math, we see slight declines, which again mimics what we've seen at the state level in math. <clears throat> For high school, again, <laughs> trend lines are very similar to what we see at the state level. Um, different in high school is, is both ELA and math are trending down. Um, and I do want to point out, and we'll kind of see this in the next graph, high school is a little bit different than the other schools because we only test 11th graders. So this is a cohort by cohort um, kind of an out, like comparison. This is not a whole school. This is one distinct group of students, and we're testing a different group of students each year. Um, so this in this graph, we have all four years uh, of um, test scores, and then on the right is the main averages for high school students. So you can see that ELA has just kind of keeps working its way down uh, by small steps year over year. And then in our high schools, in our high schools, we see kind of this fluctuation kind of up and down across the years. And then a very similar picture for, for math across the district or sorry, across the state, we're going down a little bit each year, but then internally we see in our district that our schools, we kind of have this fluctuation up and down, up and down. And again, a lot of that is related to the fact that we're just looking at one group of student, different groups of students each year. Let me just add to that and just really underscore that point. I think that you, know, you noticed that we only showed um, <clears throat> 16 to 19 comparisons because we are interested in the long-term projection but we thought it was important for you to see at the high school level because it's a single year of kids that are being tested whereas for the others you're seeing you know third through fifth grade you're th seeing sixth through eighth grade that are being tested so those kids are tested some of them you know some of them have been tested the eighth graders have been tested three times are in those scores three times but at the high school level because we only have the 11th grade we wanted to show you the single grade because you see those bigger um, jumps from school um, from one 11th grade class to the next year's 11th grade class. I think that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just want to sort of underscore the, the key point of the presentation, which is that, you know, the overall we track very closely with the state and um, that our achievement gaps continue to be the real story behind our data. We've done things over the last um, two years to really begin to tackle the achievement gap in, um, you know, in our work. And I think that that is the point of these presentations is for you to understand what are the key strategies that we have put in effect to actually make a difference in those areas. And so um, we talked about the pre-kindergarten work, we talked about the behavioral health continuum over the last few meetings, and then today we're going to talk about core instruction, because core instruction is really what gets at the heart of our achievement goal and the reason that, you know, the, that um, we wanted to feature it along Inside our MEA results. Um, I think it's really important for us to remember that we're doing this work in a district where there has been very little commitment and very little investment in centralized thinking about teaching and learning. And so I'm incredibly grateful for the board's support over the last two years to help build our capacity as a district to do that. Um, today you're going to hear from the team that is actually leading that work and that has done a tremendous amount of um, work to get us to where we are. Um, and they're going to focus on some of those areas where we are really um, putting our efforts. And so you're going to hear from Malia and her team as they talk about some of the work that we've been able to do thanks to the resources that have been made available to us to begin to um, do this work. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Malia. Okay. So 
we have quite the team with us tonight, <laughs> um, which thank you to everyone, especially those of you teaching bright and early tomorrow morning for being with us this evening to share a little bit of a window into their work um, with you all so you can kind of better understand what we're up to. Um, and I do just want to underscore what the superintendent just said that, you know, clearly these results are not what we want. And we believe strongly that um, all of our students can achieve at high levels. And it is within our control to be able to improve achievement. Um, and as you listen to the progress update we're going to share about core instruction, I just want to remind you that um, the work takes time. So in order to move this forward, we need to get ourselves aligned around what are we trying to accomplish build the skills and mindsets that advance us toward that, provide the right resources, give the support, see through implementation, all this stuff. So um, a lot of the work that we're gonna talk about in a moment is stuff that's um, newly underway and that we believe strongly is um, the right stuff to be doing to um, change the results that you just heard. So like we've talked about with each of these progress updates, this core instruction priority aligns to the Portland Promise, most specifically to our achievement and equity goals. And again, like the superintendent mentioned, this is the third of three updates around um, key priorities that we named um, and where we invested this year as a district. Um, this is just reminding you all about the why behind core instruction. Um, I think first, of course, the data illuminates that we have work to do, um, especially in regard to the gaps we see between student groups, which we think of as opportunity gaps. Um, also, last spring, for those of you who were on the board, you might recall we, when we were kind of rolling out the core instruction work, um, we talked about several reasons as to why we feel like this is a, a critical need and focus for us as a system. First. Um, we have a lot of variation in terms of what's happening um, in, in our core instruction. So it could be very different what a student experiences depending on which school they go to and which set of teachers they happen to get. And our high school students have told us that very directly. Um, we also have incredibly talented teachers throughout the system. And so one of the kind of uh, refrains that I often hear is pockets of excellence. We have amazing things happening, extremely smart, um, thoughtful, dedicated teachers, but not a success systemic approach to understanding what are people doing, how can we learn from that, how can we spread that. Um, We've also talked about the fact that when we looked back, and those of you on curriculum committee will remember these conversations at where we're putting our time, energy, and resources, it was disproportionately focused on intervention. And so our intervention focus and budget was bigger than our core instruction focus. And so our shift is to not think about what do we need to do to catch kids up on the side, but rather what do we need to do to our core instruction so that it meets the needs of all of our learners and catches them where they're at and brings them up to grade level learning. Um, and then finally, you know, when looking at the research, we know teacher quality curriculum and a culture of collective efficacy have a significant effect on student achievement. The effect size of those things are greater than factors such as poverty, such as home life. So a lot of times people will feel like these are the reasons. And yes, certain students have additional barriers to overcome. Um, but ultimately, when you're looking at the effect size of these other things, they're within our control. And, and that's why we're focused on this, on this work. Um, and so in terms of core instruction, we did articulate this year a more explicit theory of action around um, our core instruction work, which is here. And it's basically that if all students get exposed to relevant engaging grade level learning with the appropriate supports and scaffolds, they're more likely to master grade level content. Um, and put in a slightly different and perhaps more direct way, um, we say that if they're not exposed to grade level learning because they're either pulled out or aside or taught something different or because the tasks themselves don't align to the grade level standards, then of course they're never gonna learn on grade level. So that kind of grounds the work that we're doing around core instruction. There are several things we are focused on in relationship to core instruction. These four have, um, are kind of the main areas of focus in relationship to core instruction. So first is about uh, content coherence. Um, the second is related to a lot of deep work around math pedagogy and curriculum. Um, the third area is, is focused on early literacy development and then finally continuing um, the proficiency-based learning work we've done um, for several years. And underlying all of that is um, 
a little bit of a shift in our strategy where we're integrating high leverage EL principles throughout our curriculum instruction. So we've been sort of trying to figure out how do we do that PD, and it's felt more like an add-on or an addition to. And so <coughs> our shift this year is to bake that work into the literacy work, the math work, and the content coherence work. Um, so a lot of that is co-led by EL teacher leaders along with literacy experts, math experts, et cetera. So basically what Oh, did you hear the superintendent? No. EL, EL, English learners, not expeditionary learning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, great. So I think in terms of uh, presentation approach, we're going to do a quick progress update on each one, share a couple illustrative examples, and that's where the team of folks are here to do that for you all, and then sum it up with kind of where we're headed next in each of these four areas. Um, so the first thing is to share a little bit about what's happening with our vertical content work. Um, so this, this work builds on the proficiency work that's been underway for multiple years where we've worked across schools in the district to look at our standards and make sure there's a logical progression of learning through the standards. And it also kind of builds off of the work we did to establish district beliefs and core practices that would anchor that work. Um, and so we have what we're calling pre, uh, vertical content teams. Um, several of you have served on or been invited to be members of these teams. The focus of this work is really around coming up with content-specific instructional visions that are more about the pedagogy um, than the sort of what of what we're teaching, which is already reflected in the standards work. Um, this work is really thinking about how do we deepen the coherence in terms of learning for our students. So this is where I talked about um, it could be the case that depending on the school you go to and the teacher you get, for example, in science, you get exposed to the same topic multiple times. So during the science meeting, I was there and there, the teachers were laughing, and Brooke helped me here, that we, thank you, that um, everybody teaches plate tectonics. Like, it's just like a thing. So it's like, you know, they were like, you teach that? You, you know, so it's like, oh wow, you could learn that six different times. Um, and yes, there might be a deepening of that, but that's not happening in, in an intentional way because people aren't aware of what's coming before and what's coming after. Um, so it's both pedagogically, what, how do we want to create coherence? So for example, in math, if you're learning a routine, how does that build from elementary to middle, but also in terms of how the content progresses over a, a student's career. Um, and I think the other thing I'd just like to feature is that we're really looking at who are the experts around the work, and it's the teachers. So this is an opportunity for us to promote teacher leadership in relationship to um, visioning around what we want the experience of our students to be, and then advising us around how do we align our system to that vision. For example, how do we put the right curriculum in place, align the resources to what we're trying to accomplish, et cetera. So the content areas that we have um, going right now, math, this is year two, um, and this is year one for social studies, science, computer science, ELA, and um, health as well. So um, we're going to hear from um, Brooke Teller, who I think many of you have met before, teacher leader who's working on science, and then Fiona Hopper to just get a, a little bit of a window into how this is playing out in science and social studies. Hello. So um, I do want to share some of the things that we've been working on as a vertical science team in terms of our instructional vision, um, but just give you some context of sort of how we've moved to that point. And that's been through my work at Riverton, now the Talbot Community School. Um, and we have been working on science there for two years. Last year while I was on sabbatical, I was helping them with their science curriculum. And now this year I'm, I'm back there again so that we can start to develop elementary science curriculum that could be rolled out to all of our elementary schools. So as Malia was talking about having some sort of systemic plan for how we're going to be making sure that students are receiving similar information in any one of our elementary settings. And one of the biggest things with working with a lot of experts um, on this work is the idea of phenomena-based curriculum. 
And so I just wanted to explain what I mean by that and then um, give a few more examples. So in sciences, looking at phenomena would be taking something from the natural world that might be curious or puzzling. And it could be a picture of maybe a close-up of a bee with pollen on its head, um, an image of the Grand Canyon, and presenting it to students so that they can start to try to make sense of what that image is and from that actually drive the learning. So um, as we started to talk about as a vertical science team, what would um, instruction look like for our students, uh, we had three main ideas. So science classrooms, we would see teachers anchoring their instruction in complex and puzzling natural events or phenomena. Secondly, we would see them using various uh, strategies for discourse or science talk so that students can think deeply and respond to each other's thinking, and that we would see students engaging in multiple rounds of creating and revising scientific models, uh, explanations, and evidence-based arguments. So really putting the work into the hands of the students as they try to make sense of the world around them. So I have um, a little participation activity for you all. Um, here is a possible image that could be shown to a group of students, maybe in third grade. Um, and I might then ask the students, what do you see in this picture? What do you notice or wonder? And maybe some of you could share your thinking while you're sitting there. Water. You see water. I, I see water being separated as it flows over something. Excellent. Thank you. Two more ideas. What else do you notice or wonder about that image? What's the big building doing this? What's the big building? Did you have one, Emily? I, have, I wonder how much water it is. How much it's water? So much water. Excellent. And so the work that we're doing um, as teachers trying to develop our units of study are to try to think about what are the students going to ask? You guys just asked four different questions. What might an elementary student ask? And from that, the teachers are building out the lessons to help provide the activities that will help the students build the knowledge to answer the questions that they're going to be asking. And so we're starting to find that as we look at um, content, other content areas, there are some similarities in this idea of having a phenomena, having student-centered inquiry, and sense-making. So. Hi, everyone. I'm Fiona Hopper, and I'm the um, teacher leader of the social studies vertical team and also the Wabanaki studies coordinator. Um, and uh, the vertical team this year includes uh, educators, pre-K-12, administrators, also indigenous parents uh, from the Portland Public Schools, and students from the Black Students Union at Deering High School. Um, because those students initiated some curriculum review work that aligns nicely with what we've taken on this year. And our um, emergent instructional vision work is grounded in um, making sure that things are inquiry-based for students. So you can already see some connection to what Brooke was just talking about, that we're, we're working on um, a curriculum that would be developed around compelling questions. So students are in elementary school being sort of trained in how do you ask questions, and then they're then taking the reins in middle and high school, leading inquiry, developing their own compelling questions with some um, teacher direction. Um, a curriculum that prioritizes, or an instructional vision that prioritizes depth over breadth, um, and inclusion of multiple perspectives, development of critical thinking, and uh, ultimately preparation for civic engagement, because that is the, uh, the overall purpose of social studies work. Um, so one way, one sort of example of how this might look that complements what Brooke was discussing is uh, if we were to start with the compelling question, what is the relationship between dams and people, um, that might lead us to reevaluate what has traditionally been uh, called the third grade Portland study. Um, this has happened for years and years, and it's typically uh, a study of landmarks in Portland, all built um, during, mostly during the colonial period, early colonial period, kind of into the early 1900s. Um, so if we were to take a, an instructional vision approach that prioritized uh, student-centered inquiry, perspective-taking, and engagement, um, we might instead be looking at 
a Presumpscot River watershed um, unit in which students are looking at the relationship between a people and an ecosystem, helping to then reframe not only the scientific phenomena of dams and what dams, um, how they do interact with the ecosystem, but also the history of this place. Um, students might learn that in 1739, Chief Polin, a Wabanaki chief of the area, traveled to Boston to implore Governor Belcher to force Thomas Westbrook, of who Westbrook the town is named after, to include fish, fish passage in the massive dam he built at the Presumpscot Falls. Um, and in so doing, students would be asked to grapple with the complex relationships between peoples, economies, technologies, and ecosystems. And this is the kind of rich learning that we believe um, will engage students and also allow students to see themselves and their diverse identities reflected in the curriculum. And now I'm going totally off script just for one second. Um, <laughs> to be expected. Um, which is, I feel remiss uh, without sort of just naming the connection between the historic event that was here just an hour ago and the curriculum work that we're presenting uh, tonight. That it can, uh, instructional vision work can be tedious. Uh, and it can, it certainly pales in comparison to what we had earlier. Um, but in my view, it is about the how. Um, it's how we make legacies of resistance and advocacy like those of Mr. Talbot and the communities he represents enshrined in curriculum. And in so doing, it's how we move to repair the dignity named by um, the powerful quote shared by Mrs. Bondo earlier. It's how we repair the, the dignity or do our part as a school district in repairing dignity of, of marginalized peoples. Um, so I just wanted to name that this is a critical instructional vision work is a critical lever in forwarding um, the equity vision of the Portland Public Schools. Thank you. Well said, Fiona. Um, uh, my name is Jesse Robinson. I'm the Director of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction. And um, as you might have heard, there are some emerging cross-disciplinary pedag pedagogical themes in what Brooke and Fiona just talked about. And so some of our next moves are to highlight those connections between different content areas and really connect them to our core practices. Another next move is to um, align our resources, curriculum, and PD to those visions and make sure that any barriers that exist um, that we're working towards removing them. And then some specific next steps around um, content areas. For example, math is really focused on structures that prevent or enable all students to access rigor at all levels of, of math. And then health is focused on consent consent education and ELA is really looking at our anchor texts and novels across the system um, and aligning those. So next we want to give an update on um, math pedagogy and curriculum. So in terms of the work to date, so what we've been focused on this year, I'd say as a headline, we're focused on capacity building and sustained implementation support. We're going to talk in a minute about curriculum. And certainly in this district, we've adopted curricula before and put it out there. But I think really what's driving the whole strategy behind math is more about sort of deep engagement and support that's um, sustained for teachers over time um, in relationship to the skills and mindsets that we're trying to grow. So I think first I want to call out the mindset work. Um, you know, we often talk with the math coach team like the math work is our equity work. So it's not different. It's one and the same. It's the place where some of the conversations we're having that are reflective about implicit bias and privilege kind of get applied in concrete ways in terms of then what are the moves we're making, the choices that are happening in a math classroom um, that get us the results that you saw earlier. Um, and so this is connected to the equity work, but also sort of where we started with our math coach team in, in an exploration of how do we really make sure all of us genuinely believe that all students can and should engage in rigorous math through rich and challenging tasks? Um, so that's kind of the first piece that we're focused on. And then related to that is the support for teachers. And so this is about deep, ongoing, sustained professional development um, that's anchored around a set of instructional practices that we have alignment on um, at the elementary and middle and emerging at the high school level. And we're prioritizing practices that we feel are most high leverage for us in our context, specifically in thinking about um, meeting the needs of English language learners. Um, 
also a part of the support for teachers isn't just the PD that happens, but then the wraparound support. So if we're doing new learning together, then how are we following that up with support? And so that's where we have um, an investment in coaching at the elementary and the middle level at this point. Um, and then finally, as we're building out um, more common understanding around the pedagogy that we're trying to shift toward, uh, we want to follow that up with quality resources that line up with what we're learning. Um, and so that's where we're looking at the illustrative mathematics curriculum, which the team is going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. All right, so um, we are using illustrative mathematics at the middle school level. This is in our second year. and. Um, and we are piloting a program in the, uh, the program in elementary schools currently. And so I wanted to talk a little bit more about this program. We're really excited about it for a few reasons. Um, first, we know it's really rigorous and challenging. And we know that because the people that wrote it are the writers of the Common Core. Uh, and so we know that challenging and rigorous uh, standards is what we know all of our students can achieve and, and be successful on. We also like it because it's accessible to all students. Uh, it's designed in a way that has, um, uh, that is based on research out of Stanford that tells us how uh, students who are er learning English um, best learn both content and language at the same time. And so certain language routines are built into the program to support English language learners. And finally, we we really like it because it's aligned to our vision. So we believe that there needs to be a pedagogical shift in math in which instead of a teacher standing up in front of a class telling them how to teach something and then having students practice it, instead it's a problem-based approach. And so what that means is students are given a problem, uh, they're given time to explore it, to grapple with it, to um, to talk about it with their friends. And then uh, the teacher is really facilitating a discussion in which students are sharing their thinking, sharing the different strategies that they've um, come up with. And then um, the teacher is then synthesizing the learning at the end of the lesson. And so to demonstrate this, uh, uh, here to talk about her classroom is Julie Rosenberg. She's teaching sixth grade at Lincoln Middle School and is in her second year of implementing illustrative mathematics. She's going to show us a video um, of her classroom and, and talk a little bit about the shift she has made in her instruction since implementing the curriculum. You talk first and okay. then I'll play. All right. Hi. Um, my experience with this curriculum is that there are routines that are embedded that are unique to illustrative mathematics and really do promote students to do most of the mathematical talking <clears throat> pardon me, and thinking in the classroom. In the clip you're about to see, students had just engaged in one of these routines where in order to understand and solve a problem, they had to come up with questions that would help them to obtain missing information that they needed in order to solve it. During this portion of the clip, students have acquired the missing information and are attempting to solve the problem in pairs. You'll notice that all students are engaged, are in active discussions with their partners, and are free to solve the problem with multiple strategies. Before using this curriculum, my practice involved more direct and explicit instruction, and I see my current role evolving um, to one in which I do act as more of a facilitator to student collaboration and discussions. In my experience, I have seen increased engagement in my students, more risk taking, better peer collaboration, and an increased ability to explain and synthesize their thinking and others' thinking. This is definitely a shift in my instruction from curricular programs I've used in the past. Okay, so we know that for device A, it costs $15, so we can write that A is $15. We know that B is $25, and we know that C is $40. And also, we know that Jada has 60% of the money needed to buy device C. And then we have to go up to 1%? Yeah. 
She's one point. So that would be our answer. Oh, totally stuck. I know that I'm on the right track and I just don't know what to do. Oh yeah, it's 24. It's 24. Okay, so, so I think the is 24. So we had to find out how much 60% was. So we found out how much 50% was, which was $20. And we found out how much 10% was, which was $4. So we added them together to get 60% and it was $24. Thank you, Julie, and thank you for sharing a window into your classrooms. Great. We're excited to see the impact of the curriculum on student learning and achievement. But um, one of the things that we're cognizant of is that there is a lag between implementing something brand new and seeing results. So we've been looking at some research about implementation, and some, here's a quote from some of that research. In managing change, patience is central. Because implementation rates increase as time goes on, it's difficult to measure impact of a curriculum before teachers feel comfortable actually implementing it. Therefore, school leaders and government officials should wait for curriculum to take hold before evaluating its impact uh, or moving on to something new. Finland, for example, reviews its curriculum every 10 years. That being said, we did do some analysis of the MEA and corresponding content to see if what we had taught students learned. And of the students of the units that we taught, we saw increased results over the state, which is pretty exciting. Additionally, we saw that in um, with teachers, grade levels, and schools, where fidelity was, um, where we saw fidelity and support for teachers, we saw we saw even better results. Um, the next, we'd like to talk a little bit about Longfellow and some of the results that we've seen there as well. Um, one example, sorry, Longfellow has shown significant growth in math on the 2019 MEA. And math has been a focus priority for them for three years. So it's really sustained, sustained attention to math. They, um, they report that they had increased levels of professional development around math and they're seeing um, they're seeing some really great gains, not only here, but also in student engagement. The Sue um, Carrado, the math coach there, says, students are persevering to complete high demand tasks and expressing how much they like math. So our next moves in math are to, um, next year we're gonna have an aligned curriculum K through eight. So um, all schools are gonna be using illustrative mathematics in every grade K through eight, which is very, very exciting for all of us. Um, we're going to continue to work towards removing barriers um, so that all students are accessing core instruction at all levels. We also hope to implement uh, structures to support students who need more time. And at the high school level, we're um, looking deep, more deeply at grade courses, um, ninth grade courses and curriculum, and aligning those to the eighth grade students that are coming to them from the schools where they've been learning IM math. Um, we're also looking a little bit more into using illustrative math at the Algebra 1 level. All right, so the third of the four areas we wanted to feature this evening is um, to give you a little update about on the work we're doing around early literacy development. So um, here I think the big thing to understand is that we're focused on really making sure we have explicit phonics instruction embedded in, into the early literacy block. And at the same time, once again, this theme of integrating the high leverage EL practices. So a few things that we've been working on here. First is in relationship to honing teacher's skills. So when our literacy coaches came together um, last year, one of the observations they had is that teachers uh, I mean, we have a lot of solid, strong foundation actually in our literacy work, and you see we have much better results there, and we've been using the, the workshop model for many years now, and I think it's evident in the outcomes. Um, but one of the areas that um, coaches felt teachers could continually kind of hone in terms of their skill set is um, a deep understanding of how a reader develops, so that then they can sort of sit with the reader and understand 
what typically, like where they'd be coming from, where they're going next, and they can really assess where this reader's at and what's the right next move for them. Um, and so a body of work that's happening is really around professional development, and yet again, that wraparound coaching support for the follow through. Um, also, we're then focused on the fl explicit phonics instruction. So um, while we've had a lot of awesome work um, with the, the workshop model, we have not had a district-wide phonics program. So we had some schools that um, were literally using three different programs within the school. Uh, many schools who were using really an intervention program as their phonics curriculum. Um, and so since I've been here, um, I've heard coaches and principals talk about we really need to establish what's the program, how does it align to the research we're grounded in, um, and we're cognizant of kids moving throughout the district. That's really tricky and hard, especially for kids that are most likely to move, have a lot of needs, and so to move from one program to another, you know, it's just, it creates a lot of challenges and that we're creating our own barrier in, in kind of doing that. So that's a big focus and the team will talk about that in a minute. And then finally, um, it's been really, really awesome to see the literacy coaches um, collaborate with EL teacher leaders to both design and then lead the PD series that's around reading development. So again, that very um, kind of embedded approach to building capacity and skills so it doesn't feel like we're doing literacy development and then we're doing you know EL practices over here but really we're pr trying to pull it together because um, of course the teachers have to pull it all together in terms of their practice in planning and, and teaching. So that's kind of the work that we've been up to so far this year and I think the team's now going to talk a little bit more about the phonics um, curriculum in particular. Great, so a little bit about the phonics programs. Um, so we implementing, we're implementing two phonics programs. The first one is Lively Letters and the other one is Teachers College Phonics. Lively Letters is an explicit and systematic approach to phonics uh, that's multi-sensory and multimodal. So uh, it uses pictures and songs and stories and mouth movements and hand signals. And um, Teachers College is a, a word study program that's aligned to our teachers college units of study that is used in eight out of nine of our elementary schools. So you might ask, why do we need two programs? We chose two because we needed both the systematic, um, systematic explicit approach, uh, as well as one in which students can apply what they're learning in their reading and writing work. So it's really, they, it really serves two purposes that are super important to the development of reading, um, reading skills. And then um, to support this work, we've been doing learning walks. So essentially, we've we've we launched the the programs at the beginning of the year, and then throughout the year, we're we're walking, um, we're going from classroom to classroom to see how's it going, and um, talking about how we can better support teachers um, to make sure that the implementation sticks and that people are are really successful. So here to talk about that work in. Um, in phonics is the Reiki crew, and the one person I did not have up here is Kathy Feenstra, and she's the first grade um, teacher. So we have Maureen Fox, Lori Bobinski, and Kevin Brewster, and Kathy Feenstra. Oh, Lori's not here today. I'm here. She's here. She's not speaking. Oh, she's not speaking. Not speaking. Can you come up to Lori though? Just stand right Let's come up together. Yeah. You're part of the team. You're part of the team. More else to close. Thank you. Someone else. Okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Lively Letters and what it is, and describe the program. And there was a, um, a vetting process of which program to select. And we decided to go with Lively Letters for the following reasons. It's, um, it's research proven. Um, it's supported by data that's inclusive of English language learners. Um, it works well with all students, but especially with students who are learning English as an additional language, as well as students with special needs. So that inclusivity was important to us in selecting a program. And as Jesse said, it, um, well, she said that, uh, she talked about it being multimodal, and um, it really includes an embedded imagery and mouth, hand, body cues, music, funny stories that have a, num a mnemonic element for students to remember. And um, the other thing is that it was developed by speech and language pathologists. And so one of the things also that we read is that for students, for some students, they're going to take to learning to read more easily than others, but the ones 
that find it to be somewhat challenging, they tend to need that explicit <coughs> phonics work. And, um, and so speech and language pathologists have found that when students get this type of program, there are less referrals for, for speech and language through special education. Um, and it's engaging, it's fun, and kids like it. And it's an easy access point even for our English learners who are coming brand new, don't have the English language, but they can sing songs and they can dance and they can move and they can participate with their peers. So, and so the Reiki teachers are gonna talk about their experience with the program. So Reiki School has a very diverse population, as you know, with over 11 languages spoken. Additionally, 70% of our students receive free or reduced lunch, 10% of our students are homeless, and we have new students joining classrooms throughout the year at Reiki. Um, Lively Letters has provided an entry point for all learners. Every student, no matter when they enrolled, what their home language is, regardless of their family's income, they've been engaged in learning about the letters in grades K through two this entire school year so far. A number of the teachers at Reiki were initially um, reticent to start a new program during the beginning of this school year. However, as we pause and look at student work and assessments, we see many of the highlights. Typically at this time of year, about 50% of our K students have mastered 50 or more letter sounds. And now at this time of year, it's about 65% as of last week. Um, in the first grade, we typically are hitting hard on the, volume, on the vowels all year long. And at this time now, after doing Lively Letters and the new phonics program, um, almost all of our first graders know all their short vowel sounds especially. The, um, the key of it is that when the kids are trying to come up with the letter sounds, especially during writing workshop, the hand signals come to them on their own. They're working more independently. I can see my first graders sounding out letters and saying, ah, 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 or eh, eh, eh. Or I can go to them and say, okay, ah, ah, ah. And they know what the letters are now. And they're moving their bodies, which is so good for these kids. They need to move. Um, so it just makes our job easier and more fun, definitely. Um, it means that they're more willing to attempt an unfamiliar word instead of asking for help. And our second graders are now not only thinking about letter sounds, but how words look. They are um, far less hesitant to attempt an unfamiliar word. The assessment component um, for us as teachers is fast, it's easy to score, and it speaks directly to the needs of the students. I have an easy graph that I can look at, and I know exactly what every one of my students needs in their phonics work at this time. And now here's Kevin. So I have a quick success story. Uh, Kathy and I share a student that's currently in second grade, and we've been closely monitoring her uh, both academically and socially and emotionally since she, since she started kindergarten. She's been through the RTI process. She's received various interventions. She's been in a friendship group uh, and attended summer school for two summers. Um, but we believe that Lively Letters has been one of the key components to her steady growth this year. Uh, if you had seen this young lady at the beginning of second grade this fall, you'd have noted that she was often in the back of the class uh, and participated only when called upon. You would have assumed she was shy and she lacked confidence and engagement as a learner. The exception was during Lively Letters. During li Lively Letters, she independently sat near the front, leaned into the instruction and was eager to participate, often waving her hand enthusiastically in the air. After becoming confident knowing all of her letter sounds, she began to volunteer to, deco to decode CVC words and CVCE words during Lively Letters lessons. She now confidently decodes unknown words in the story she's reading. She began the year, a full year behind, beginning at a beginning first grade level, and is now reading books in the mid to end of first grade level. So she's made almost a year's progress in the first half of this year. Um, she still has a long way to go, um, but her confidence and engagement and affect has changed to that of a confident, curious learner, and we can put this instruction, instructional program um, right at the top of the list of why she's being so successful. So, thank you. 
Great. Thank you all. That was great. Um, our next moves for early literacy are to continue to roll out phonics in K through 2 over the next two years with high quality materials and professional development and to continue to provide literacy PD for pre-K to five teachers over the next two years. Next year's focus will be on content literacy. Okay. And then our last um, update is around the uh, work we've been doing for years on proficiency-based learning. So really this year is about deepening our practice and more learning from each other. Um, so some of the highlights in terms of what's happening around proficiency-based learning are first that we're continuing the work to align instruction and assessment to the common grade level standards that we've worked on across the district. Um, Teachers are kind of continuing to hone how they give feedback for students that's precise in terms of uh, what they know and what they need to keep working on. Um, there has been kind of a pivot toward more collaborative structures, and, and especially this is true, I think this was, has been happening across schools, certainly at the middle school level, but in the high schools we see a lot of work around professional learning communities. Um, uh, there's some support from a great schools partnership coach where she's really getting in there with content teams to look at um, their assessments and student work. So this shift from the technical work that's happening school-wide to talk about policy and more toward these PLC structures to look at actual assessments um, and then finally we're trying to build towards support structures um, that are more embedded um, for the students who need more time and support um, in order to meet the grade level standard and so I think that's work that is a lot of planning work this year for for more rollout and implementation next year and that will certainly surface in some of the future conversations we have um, but the, that's kind of where we're at and what the focus of this year's work in relationship to proficiency has been I should have looked at the agenda more closely and changed the slide before this presentation. So one example is Talbot Elementary. Um, the percent of students proficient in ELA at Talbot has increased at a steady, statistically significant rate since 2016. And Hannah, principal at Talbot, speaks to a few strategies that have helped her achieve these results. First, teachers broke down standards to really understand them. Then they realized their curriculum was not quite aligned to those standards and revi or, um, aligned their curriculum and their instruction to those standards. And then they worked um, deeply in collaboration with each other to align standards to lessons, to assessments, and to their tasks. Um, another school that has seen significant growth is Lyman Moore. And here to share some strategies related to profici uh, proficiency-based learning is Principal Ben Donaldson. I'm so awake. Woo! Um, <laughs> all right. So I'll be I'll be brief. <laughs> um, so and I would just say quickly that with proficiency-based learning, we've been at this for years. Um, this is year four of having it as a focus, um, and it really, at its core, connects achievement and equity, um, because everything that you do in a proficiency-based system is about um, taking the intended learning out of the minds of the teachers and putting it out between teachers and kids so that um, that learning is clear and that kids can access it, all kids can access it. Um, so specifically in what we think led to some of this growth um, in our community um, are some key instructional moves. So all teachers are planning from standards, very similar to what you heard from Riverton or Talbot. Um, they're clear about criteria for both meeting standards and exceeding standards. So being really super clear with kids about you know, what's grade level and what is beyond in terms of skills um, and knowledge. And then we're working at giving really specific and actionable feedback to kids. So using those criteria to say, oh, you've got this, but you could really push yourself here. Or you don't yet have this, and this is what you need to add to your work or really draw out of your work. Um, and so those are all on the instructional side. That's what teachers are doing day to day. Um, on more of the structural kind of school side, um, a lot of what Malia was talking about earlier, um, in the past special education or, specific, um, or SDI classes, specially designed instruction, often would be separate from a grade level class. Um, so kids with IEPs would be, set, would be educated in a different space um, and not at the grade level. So if you're behind, you would get instruction behind to try to catch you up. Um, 
We've gone away from that model and we now have a co-teaching model. Um, so students who are close to grade level are in a co-taught class with a special educator and a grade level teacher um, getting access to grade level content. And they're making really good progress, um, students are. The other thing is that um, our kind of intervention type classes um, that Gail has helped us with and supported over the years, um, as we have less of that, um, we actually did a switch and that never replaces a grade level class for a kid. Um, if they're behind, we know they need more support and more time to get help in working on those skills. So it's always in addition to a grade level class. So they spend part of their day, a kid does, getting grade level instruction um, at grade level and then specific targeted support on areas where they're still having, having trouble. So it's always in addition to instead of in place of, which is a, a key mistake that um, we've learned has happened a lot over the years. So those are some of the pieces. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, so our next moves in terms of proficiency are to connect standards alignment to instructional pedagogy work. Um, so kind of uh, aligning all of these different um, initiatives together. Um, staying the course by providing teachers with time to collaborate and plan, which is really, really important. Continue some of the te technical tweaks, such as uh, changing credits to units of proficiency. And then focusing for next year on some of the support structures that Ben was talking about, um, such as providing students with more time or more um, support in addition to the, to the grade level um, uh, standards that they have access to in their core, core content uh, classes. And with that, we welcome questions. Any board questions? Ms. Moriani. I know it's getting late for my fellow board members, and but I, I'm just enthralled by all this, having been on the curriculum uh, committee for, for many years, it feels like. Um, I really feel like we're making, this is really great work. I really appreciate all your hard work, and I really appreciate all the teachers that are staying late with us um, to explain everything. I really do. Um, and I just want to say, so, um, uh, several years we've gone to the National School Board Conference and there was a session that I attended one time and it was all about how to take a low performing school district and, and turn it around and what were some of the, and this is actually was in uh, Pennsylvania, there was a district, and, and I took copious notes thinking, okay, you know, someday this could happen here. And, and it feels like this is happening here because some of the things you were talking about was um, that, that resonated with me what were learning for, for kids to be able to answer that question of how and becoming much more inquisitive in their learning um, and um, and that's that seems to be really a key piece as well as um, to having the um, having the teachers feel more like a facilitator uh, one of you mentioned that that feeling like okay you're gonna step back have them work collaboratively together uh, having um, the problem solving happening right in front of you but backing away and letting them essentially run the class, so to speak, and what happens then is they feel more empowered and then the peer-to-peer -peer relationships improve and again, I think that that could just do wonders also with our equity goal of trying to make, they, they're working with all of them to, you know, mix together is just so wonderful to see and um, so I'm just very excited by this and uh, and I think, and also honestly, going back to our, our data, I appreciate very much that data presentation too because although we seem to think okay we're not doing as well and we're tracking more with the main state results and but when you look at the fact that we have 23.4 percent EL students and you look at the rest of Maine that only has about 3.1 percent EL students I mean I think we're actually doing fairly well with that. I mean, just in the sense that, and, and you're talking about wrapping, making sure our EL students are supported more in all of the instruction. I, I'm very, uh, I'm, I know we've got a lot to improve upon, but I'm feeling very hopeful. So I very much appreciate all your hard work and thank you for this presentation tonight. What was your question? I, my question. <laughs> <laughs> What would be my question? I actually don't have a question at this time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Uh, I just, to, I just couldn't Mr. wait Burke. to say oh. the, those, <laughs> those things about how I appreciate your work. Like that, <laughs> right. We'll go Ms. Victor and then Mr. Burke. 
Thanks so much for this presentation. I particularly liked it because I had uh, my kids' kindergarten and first grade teachers here presenting. <laughs> Um, but I have a, one quick question is wondering where are we doing illustrative math now? Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer? Sure. Um, in sixth through eighth grade, it's uh, implemented um, all teachers. Um, and then K through five, it's uh, being piloted. So the illustrative math is actually writing the curriculum this year, and our, our teachers are doing the alpha pilot. Um, and that's at Presumpscott? And that's at um, all schools have some sc teachers that are doing it. We could only put in 60 teachers, but we actually had 100 teachers sign up for it, and we could only take 60. So, okay. um, Great. Um, and then I'm wondering, in terms of the next moves across the board, what are the budget um, needs to make those moves possible? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that we'll be, we'll make connections when the superintendent presents his budgets, but I, budget, um, but I think two things I would say immediately um, are continuing with the core instruction work. So, Jesse mentioned, for example, elementary, we've been doing the alpha pilot with 60 teachers. All schools voted unanimously, administrators and coaches, to do a full scale up next year, which was um, impressive and astounding, especially in our context. That doesn't happen much. Um, so there's a cost there to be the same thing with the, the phonics curriculum. So there's some curriculum um, and wraparound PD that, that shows up in the budget. And then I think the second piece is what we were alluding to in terms of support structures. So if we're trying to give all kids access to grade level learning, but they're coming in at a lot of different entry points and levels, um, how do we then create the support structures that enable them to learn at grade level? Um, and so that'll be kind of the second theme, I think, and, and will be a bigger part of the, the budget that will be put in front of you. Is that fair? Yep. Okay. Could I ask one follow-up question? Of course, yes. How, at this point, do um, our intervention, but does our intervention budget compare to our budget on core instruction? How much we're spending I, on each? I, I, I mean, I, I can't say right off the top of my head, although we have been looking at the budget a lot, but we're now tipped in the direction where we want to be, which is a greater um, investment in core instruction than intervention programs. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Burke. Yeah, thank you everybody for the presentations. I think all these questions are just to be noted and responded to later. Um, so just curious to hear more about what the diagnosis is, why math is going down across the board. Um, and this is going to sound uh, a little crass, and I'm sorry. Uh, I don't have the energy to redraft uh, this. But um, based on the data, why is Portland the worst place to be poor, academically speaking? Why is there such a significant drop at Amanda C. Rowe in both ELA and math from 2016 to 2019? It's where the majority of families in my district have kids. So I'm curious to know more about that. And then for my own education, can more be shared about the research on the effect size of teacher quality curriculum and collect or culture of collective efficacy? I just don't think I was here when that <laughs> learning happened. Um, and then this is a messy conversation, definitely not to have right now, but um, there's language that's being used about like behind, and I, I know there's there's like a standards-based definition for that, and then we have our learning beliefs that have, learners have different strengths, needs, and starting points based on who they are and what they've experienced, and they learn in different ways and time frames, so I'm just interested in having that kind of messy conversation of how we're reconciling those different worldviews, if you will. For follow-up. Yeah, for <laughs> follow-up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Ms. Bondo, you have a question? Thank you so much for your presentation because when we invested for the core instruction, I was wondering, say, how going to shape. And this is just the way I was thinking because we have focused on the student-centered learning approach. So how we can expose them to different, the way they can develop a mindset of thinking and solving problems. So I just have uh, two quick questions on, I think that's the last presentation on the middle, middle school. When you mentioned then, uh, when we facing students who really need a need, a super need, I mean, we're teaching them the, on, on the grade level and we're giving them the support they need. So I try to figure out how that one look because they are like a day out school, they need to be on, in, in the class and learn about the grade on, on the grade level and when they have a time to have the support to catch up. So how, how that one works. Yeah. 
So um, instead of choosing one or the other, um, and to, I hear your point about behind it's, is relative, um, <clears throat> but for multilingual students who are acquiring the language or um, for students who are developing some of the skills slower than some peers, um, they would have time in, say, a sixth grade English class where they're talking about sixth grade books and concepts and um, skills. And then they would spend another part of their day with a specific you know, literacy focus on developing their individual skills at writing. Um, if that is, say, from like a typical fourth grade level towards sixth grade. Mm -hmm. um, so one approach is like, what does sixth grade look like? Okay. And so they're thinking about sixth grade concepts and talking and, and getting exposed to that curriculum mm -hmm. um, and working toward that. And then another part of their day, it's really like sort of, you know, small, smaller setting and getting more individualized attention about their skills and how to boost them okay. toward that. So it's, it's both. So do we have a, a many percentage on those, on those students we have? Because those need uh, individualized support, I mean, like a mentoring or coaching yeah. one by one. So we yeah. know what's the ratio of those uh, students we may still have in our, in our school system. How, how many students? Yes, how many on that range? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in our co-taught English classes in, in a grade level, we have uh, a, less than 5% of students who, who qualify for that, mm -hmm. who need that level of support. Um, but for literacy support classes, um, at a grade level, it's, gosh, probably 30 out of 180. So a sixth of kids yeah. who, who are getting that level of support. Mm -hmm. All right. So just a quick follow-up question is on the next move to identify barriers and opportunity to align system to share. I mean, are we thinking about different strategy uh, to, to try to identify those barriers? Or are we working on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, yes, we're working on that. I think we know some of the structural barriers. Okay. Um, specifically in relationship to all students getting access to rigorous engaging instruction. Okay. And so we're actively working on that. So part mm -hmm. of it's investing in additional time and support for kids who, who need it, but there's also certain structures that um, prevent kids from getting access. So we talk about um, you know tracking. So some yeah. kids are, I mean, that starts at the elementary level in what, um, you know, we used to think was a good idea, which is ability grouping. Right. Um, and what we've come to see, it becomes tracking. You know, so we're having those conversations um, about that at the elementary and middle level. Like, how are we really making sure that we're not um, sort of deciding early on who can have access to grade level and engaging curriculum? You know, because some of the issue, too, is when kids are separated because they're behind and then they get skill-based sort of support. And then the other kids are learning some more problem-based, engaging work. So, you know, there's a whole host of structural barriers there. So I would say, you know, I don't, I think we know a lot of the barriers and it's a matter of prioritization investment and then um, all the sort of levers you have to pull to address them, which frankly start with mindset, but then are also kind of technical in nature as well. I just need a line here on the, on, on the progress to date, the support for the teachers, and I think when we talk about professional development, the, the language that I want to see adding here is about the cultural competency. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. So our teachers mm -hmm. need to have that one as a development as well, because it's so more deeper, so they can understand exactly what the different trauma about toxic stress, about ACEs, mm -hmm. happening on those uh, students who really need to have uh, those, uh, those kind of help. Yeah. for them to be able to move to the, to the better uh, learning system. Yeah, and I, I would say, I mean, I think that's where I started with like the math and saying it starts with mindset and it's where sort of equity meets achievement. So um, I 100% agree and I think that's very much the frame and orientation. And then, you know, and then I think it's how to, so for an organization that isn't used to a lot of systemic work, um, how do we do that because it does take getting people to understand some of that knowledge, start to shift mindsets, and then see and understand how it applies in actual strategies and skills. So a lot of moving parts, but I wholeheartedly agree, and it's 
absolutely the way we think about and frame frame the work. All right, thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to add that we really didn't focus on the high leverage principles. We kind of just alluded to them. But the high leverage principles are um, effective instruction for English language learners. Mm -hmm. And one, one of them is knowing your students and building that background knowledge. And that's where we really, we, we really can't instruct without knowing our students. And that culture and language and prior experience is a very important part of that. Ms. Atkinson. Uh, thank you. Um, it, this was a lot of content and, and took up a bunch of time, but I, I just want to say how much I appreciate the presentation following the, the, um, the sort of results uh, and, and stats uh, presentation to see, you know, both, uh, to, I guess, thank you to the board for, for supporting this core instruction work. Um, thank you to everyone who's actually putting it into practice because um, the, looking at the achievement gap can be really hard. Um, and I know we've had some really difficult conversations in past years when this event comes up about, you know, what are we doing? Um, how, are we, how are we tackling this? And, and so to see all of these concrete actions being taken um, is really, uh, it, it just, uh, it's, it spins it in a different way. And so I really appreciate that. Um, I also just want to say uh, my daughter's class is doing the illustrative mathematics pilot. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to volunteer um, in her classroom, and it's a it's a real huge difference uh, between you know the the content and the curriculum that she was engaging with last year and, and what she's engaging with this year. So I'm uh, I'm a big fan of illustrative math. I'm glad we're moving forward with that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else? <clears throat> Um, no, so if there's no other questions, I'll, I'll just thank everyone for the presentation. You know, I'll echo what was said. This is exciting work. Obviously, um, you have our support. Um, I think there's some follow-up questions that were brought up that are pretty important. So um, we'll look forward to particularly the stuff that's going to be part of the budget um, yeah. inter, uh, um, uh, investments. Uh, I think that we'll look forward to learning more about how we're going to be able to support and put our, so to speak, our money where our mouth is, so to speak. Yeah, right. and I'll just quickly say a recommendation is, like we've done with the last two presentations, we followed up with the deeper discussion and committee meeting, yep. curriculum committee, so we'd be happy to do that and bring those questions forward, and then the committee can decide if you guys want to bring it back to the full board. Perfect. Thank you for reminding us to that. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I just want to thank everybody who's still here. I know that um, some folks had to leave, and um, I, I appreciate uh, everything that you guys did to prepare for this, and I do think that it's really important on the heels of our data presentation to have the opportunity to understand the work that we're doing. And I can't, you know, say enough um, that, um, you know, to Mr. Atkinson's uh, comments about thanks to the board, this is, you know, this would not be um, possible without the investment that we've made, and we've got to continue those investments. And so when you ask questions about what does that um, look like, that will be the budget that we're bringing forward. And, you know, um, not to sort of jump the gun, but when um, Mr. Um, uh, Burke asks, why is Portland the worst place to be poor? I can't tell you exactly why, but I can tell you that Part of it is because we don't invest in the type of instructional supports that are going to allow you know, all students to rise to those levels. And so that's you know, the challenge that we've taken on, that I know the board has taken on, and that we will continue to bring to you is you know, what is it going to take to be able to create the kind of structures that enable all students to reach um, high standards. And you know, I'm committed to doing that. I know our team is committed to doing that. We will continue to bring that to you. So. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. I think they definitely deserve some applause for all that. Yeah. Um,
Uh, real quick, I want to, um, again, I'm, I'm going to suggest that we take something else in the agenda out of order, um, just because I suspect that there is someone that's been sitting here for a long time to um, provide public comment for something that's not on our agenda. Um, and if we wait uh, seven more minutes, we won't allow for that. So if it's okay with the board, I want to take the public comment before the end of the meeting. Is that okay? Um, so given that it's before the hour of 10 o'clock, is there any public comment on items that are not in this evening's agenda? Uh, George Rowe, West Bayside. Um, thank you for giving me a, a seven-minute uh, grace. <laughs> well, you, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you still have only three minutes. <laughs> but but I wanted to. I, I recognize I you've been sitting here I, all I'm day. I'm saying you're giving. Yeah. I didn't have to wait till ten, or whatever <coughs> your rule is. But um, so I have three things that I wanted to um, uh, put out there. I'm not sure if these have already been publicly uh, briefed. Uh, the board has been publicly briefed about them, but. Um, Number one, the story that was in the newspaper that the superintendent referred to earlier in the meeting in his briefing, in his report, this calculation error or mistake or oversight of um, potentially millions of dollars in terms of the staff experience um, sort of input into the state formula, I really think that it's important for the board to get out in front of that to have it very clearly stated for the public what is going on, because still, even to me, it's still kind of clear as mud. We are in a current fiscal year. I have no idea whether there's any retroactive fixing of this, where we could get more money for this fiscal year. Uh, never mind, obviously, hopefully this problem is fixed for, for the future budget. And I'm not exactly sure where the calculations that were registered in the press and by the superintendent exactly what what fiscal year we're talking about but I don't know how many school districts across Maine have, are also screwing this up I have no idea whether if everyone realizes that they've been doing it wrong that we're gonna have a knock-on effect that is just going to decrease the amount of revenue that the state is providing because suddenly these formulas are going to have different outputs so please explain this as 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 simply and easily and clearly as possible. I am also uh, would like to know about the foundation for Portland Public Schools. Um, I was really disheartened. The one act of journalism uh, during the mayoral election was it came to light that the executive director, who is now our mayor, Kate Snyder, was making $75,000 um, as a salary. I assume there is FICA and Medicare, and I don't know if she was getting pension or health care of, of, of any or any other fringe benefits. But we are providing, the taxpayers, we're providing this salary. We're providing office space and other kinds of administrative support, I presume. You look at the annual reports put out by the foundation. You look at the 990, the IRS tax form. There is no acknowledgment anywhere that the Portland taxpayers are basically creating the foundation for all of this corporate hoo-ha, which frankly, if you look closely at those annual reports, there's not actually a lot of value added, in my view, for the work of this foundation. I don't know where we stand with the leadership transition, but I do think that the taxpayers of Portland deserve to know how much has been paid, outlaid, over the course of this arrangement since 2015, when I believe uh, Mr. Botana's uh, predecessor put this in place. It wasn't, I don't think it was his uh, uh, creation. But the, the point is, we are now at a point um, where we're maybe going to look at this again in another year because of the MOU, which is not publicly available either on the foundation's website or even on your website with any ease, that this is an arrangement that needs a, a serious independent look. Lastly, um, when you're I'm going to have one more minute, and then we'll have to ask you to no, that's fine. It up. Um, I don't have a timer here, so I'm not really. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was the Bayside Learning Center and the in the school district heads headquarters. Um, a number of people in Bayside, you know, uh, have have wondered what's going on with this facility because the uh, Bayside Learning Community has basically exited, and some people recently were telling me, oh, you know, adult education is using it, and the adult Portland adult education, to my knowledge, at least from the course catalog that's available to the public, there doesn't seem to be any classes scheduled for this facility. So my concern is what is happening? I know you guys lease a parking lot. 
uh, at public expense. Uh, and that was because there was a lot of activity at one time in this building, in this facility. There's debt service because this is basically was a botched boondoggle. We never should have bought that building. Um, but we're there now, and mm -hmm. we're paying debt service. We're paying lease costs to lease a parking lot, which I don't know if is underutilized or not. But we need to know, especially for this budget cycle, what's going on with this. Should we be subleasing to third parties as much of this empty space that's going unused as possible so that this isn't a, a further drain on, on the school district's budget and capacity that we can be using to do the kind of work that we heard tonight where we have value added versus you know other stuff that's less important. So I appreciate answers at some point to some of this and maybe that'll be forthcoming in presentations that are already scheduled. Thank you. Thank you. If there is no other public comment, we'll close the floor and back to our agenda. Uh, old business consideration and action to revise policy IHBEA programs of student programs for students with limited learning. Excuse me, limited English proficiency. Is there a motion? Ms. Victor, second by Mr. Balfins. Would the superintendent please speak to the motion? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Today we're asking you to approve changes to policy IBHEA. As you know, staff under the leadership of Assistant Superintendent Nally and Director of English Language Learning, Carlos Gomez, reviewed the Lao plan content and discussed the changes in the policy at our workshop on January 10th, 21st. Every public school district enrolling English learners must have a Lao plan to ensure the proper identification programming and English language services for its students. On an ongoing basis, districts update the policy and the plan based on latest research, demographic trends, and program evaluation. The revised policy, IHBEA, presented here incorporates recently adopted U.S. and Maine Department of Education terminology and school district organizational changes, and the edits reflect minor technical changes to the text of the policy without change to the substance of it. But the Lao plan itself does not reflect simple technical changes. This is a revision of the current 2010 plan that has been the guiding document for English language development program for the past decade. <coughs> the format is informed by the Maine Department of Education's template for law plans. The content is anchored by current practice, by current best practice, the expertise of our dedicated educators and our community's commitment to multilingual students who are English language learners. This plan is not a formality. As you saw earlier, there are notable gaps in achievement between groups of students in our district. And this, this plan tackles one of the most significant gaps heads on, head on. The changes that Carlos and his team are proposing have the potential to make a very real difference in the education of our students whose first language is not English. Changes to the plan will require changes to practice and staffing which will be reflected in my budget proposal in March. As most of you know, I was trained as an English as a second language teacher. My classroom experience was with the same students who this policy and, pro and plan are designed to help. Over the years, plans like the one that we've designed have been the gold standard in the field. Recognition that all teachers, not just those who are designated as EL teachers, have responsibility for students who are English language learners. Recognition that teachers need support in meeting the needs of those learners. Structured supports that recognize where a student is in their acquisition of language and targets support to their place in that continuum. And support for students' native language as a resource that both connects them to their heritage and identity and is a powerful building block for learning English. All of these elements are components of our proposed Lao plan. I'm anxious to see it through, and the first step is today's approval of the policy. But the true test of our ability to see it through will be our resolve to support it through the key investments that will be needed, and I look forward to working with you and our amazing staff in that effort. I'm incredibly grateful to Carlos, Maureen Fox, and the many teachers, principals, and community <coughs> members who were involved in these important revisions, and so we ask for your approval. Are there any questions on the motion? Ms. Marioni? Um, a question <clears throat> is around the, um, I know as you were talking about around significant investment, 
And I just wanted to ask about, as you're planning, is this going to be a planned, staged approach to improving, improving our Lao work yeah. in our schools? So we, we're I, still working on that. We, okay. um, <coughs> the, the chair and I have talked about um, March 3rd is the date that we are going to be talking both about our, um, our uh, Lao plan investments and our special education. At that point, we'll have a better sense of what the budget looks like. And so, you know, to the extent that it's phased or not is going to be um, what we will talk about at that point. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I just have a quick question, sort of kind of clarifying um, the, the superintendent's comments. Passing the policy itself does not have any immediate financial implications, right? That's right. Um, yeah, uh, I guess, is there any public comment on the motion? Seeing none, any board discussion? Seeing none, I'll just reiterate, I'm very excited for us to take on this conversation as part of the budget development process. Um, the superintendent and I have talked at length about the Lao plan and how important this is. Um, I've had conversations with individual board members about how this is one of those things that I'm really in, uh, passionate about and that I want to make sure that we support, but uh, clearly it is part of a greater conversation as we talk about the budget development. Um, and like, like I said, when we had the workshop, which is exciting to think about how differently we are addressing um, these students and, and how um, purposeful we are and what we're trying to achieve with it. So it's, it's yeah. It, it really is exciting. Um, having said that, all those in favor of revising policy IHBEA, programs for students with limited learning proficiency, please indicate. And that's unanimous with the students voting in favor as well. Next, uh, new business. There's no comment for, on first reads. We have a first read to approve all non-substantive changes to policies in Book D. Next, uh, personnel items. Uh, consideration and action to approve the personnel items listed. One year only teachers. Is there a motion? Ms. Trevorrow, second by Ms. Morioni. Will the superintendent please speak to the motion? No, Ms. Stoddard is here. Ms. Stoddard. Good evening. Um, before we move on to the <coughs> personnel item, I want to share an administrative acknowledgement. This is to let you know that at the end of the December, um, the district hired a new controller, so we just want to share that information with you. Um, her name is Denise Johnson. She came to us from her role as a controller uh, for the Thayer Corp in Auburn. She has more than 30 years of accounting and bookkeeping experience in the private sector, as well as nine years of school business office experience uh, at Bonnie Eagle and in Auburn. So we're happy to have her and please join us in welcoming her to the district. Um, okay, uh, the personnel item tonight is uh, an election of a one-year only teacher. Um, up for your approval. Thank you, are there any questions on the motion? Seeing none, there's no public comment on personnel items. Any board discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of approving the personnel items listed, one year only teachers, please indicate. And that's unanimous with the students voting with the majority. Thank you. Uh, we've done our public comment. Uh, adjourn. Is there, any, is there a motion to adjourn the business meeting? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Trevorrow, seconded by Ms. Thompson. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate. And that's unanimous with the students voting in favor as well. What are we laughing about?